Good evening. It is November 13th, and the, this is the first of two meetings that we have tonight, both of which will use the same Zoom link. The first meeting is the one we're about to start, and it's with, with regard to the financial indicators. It's literally when we officially kick off the budgeting season for the next year, believe it or not, even in November of this year. Um, and then the second meeting is a regular town council meeting. This meeting is a joint meeting it's called the Budget Coordinating Group, but more importantly, it is made up of the town council, the finance committee of the town council, the school committee, and the Jones Library trustees. The open meeting law has been extended and this allows us to continue holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the council physically present at a meeting location while providing the public with adequate alternative access to the meeting. This meeting is accessible in real time by Zoom, by phone, and as a live broadcast on Amherst Media Channel 9 and live stream. Given that we have a quorum of the council present, I'm calling the November 13th meeting of the town council to order at 6.04. I'll call upon each counselor by name at that time. Please unmute your mic and say present. This will indicate that we can hear you and you can hear us. And then please remember to mute your mic. That same set of instructions is true for the rest of the committees as well when I call on your chair to call you to order. Um, Shalini Balmilne. Present. Pat DeAngelis. Present. Anna Devlin Gothier. Present. Lynn Griesmer is present. Mandy Johanneke. Present. Anika Lopes is not present at the time. Michelle Miller is not present at the time. Dorothy Pam. Here. Pam Rooney. Here. Kathy Shane. Here. Andy Steinberg. Present. Jennifer Taub is not present at the time. Alicia Walker. Present. I'm expecting Alicia, but I don't. Oh, I'm sorry. Alicia. You said present. Thank you. Oh, I know. I have to flip my screen. There's so many of us on screen. Good evening, Alicia. Thank you. At this time, I'm calling upon the following to convene their respective bodies. School committee, Chair Irv Rhodes. Is Irv here yet? I don't believe Irv is here. Okay, Jennifer, then your vice chair, I believe. I am, and we don't have a quorum present, okay. I don't think. So we'll wait until later. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Austin Surrett, Jones Library Trustees. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, calling this meeting of the Jones Library Trustees to order. I'll ask the members of the trustees when I call your name to indicate your presence. Lee Edwards, unmute. Right. Present. Thank you, Lee. Bob Pam. Here. Farah. Farah, I mean. Here. Thank you. Alex. Present. Thank you. And uh, Tammy. Present. And Austin Sarrett is present. Okay. And the Finance Committee, the remaining members of the Finance Committee, Andy Steinberg. Yes, I'm calling the Finance Committee to order and noting that we have already established the presence of the council members, Alicia Walker, Kathy Shane, Lynn Griesmer, Anna Devon, Gallagher, and myself. Uh, so I'm going to call in the three resident members, Matt Holloway. Present. Uh, Bernie Kubiak. Present. And Bob Hegner. Present. Thank you. Okay. So, Lynn, I believe the school committee has a quorum. Okay. Jennifer? Um, seeing a quorum, I'm calling the Amherst School Committee to order. Um, when I say your name, please unmute yourself and say present. Katie Lazdowski? Present. Gabriella Weaver? Present. And Jennifer Shaw is present. And just keep an eye out to see if other people come in from the school committee and let me know. Okay, Jennifer? Thank you. Uh, there is no chat room for this meeting. If you have technical issues, please let Athena, O'Keefe, or me know. Uh, please use the raise hand function button if you would like to ask a question or make a comment. 
Uh, and if we have any difficulty uh, with the technology, we will try to determine what we're going to do at that time. Um, I wanna make note that Representative Mindy Dom is with us in the audience, as she often is. This is a regular, the regular meeting of the town council will begin sometime after seven o'clock uh, immediately following this group. Um, and there is no public comment during this particular meeting, but there will be opportunity for public comment on the others. So um, this is the official kickoff, as we mentioned. This is the process that includes many opportunities for residents to make suggestions about their priorities for the budget. One of those coming up is in fact, the quorum, I mean, the public forum on the budget, on the FY25 budget. And that begins at 6.30 next, next Monday night and will be both in person and the ability to be on Zoom. I'd like to welcome, of course, our town manager, Paul Bachman. Holly Drake, the Interim Co-Finance Director and Comptroller, Jennifer LaFontaine, Interim Co-Finance Director and Treasurer Collector, Kim Yu, Principal Assessor, and as part of this team tonight, Athena O'Keefe, our Clerk of the Town Council. And with that, I'm really going to turn it over to Paul. Thank you, Lynn, and thank you everyone for being here. This is the annual gathering of the major elected officials for the town. It's a very important night because it's when we start the budget season. And we do that by sharing information about the, the, the condition of the town's budget and how we ranked with other communities similar to us. Um, yes, we miss Sean Mangano, but we have a very, everybody nods on our team. We have a very strong team. And that's one of the blessings that Amherst has is that we have a deep bench and so, Thank you to um, Holly and Jen and, and Kim and Athena for stepping in to put this thing together. Um, so the next slide, we have about 34 slides. Seems like a lot, but we will go through them quickly. And we hope to have some time at the end for some questions. So, um, so we're on this one, that's good. Um, Tonight, we're going to talk about the, the, uh, our five-year, our 10-year monitoring report, which we do every year. We just update it annually. We're going to talk about the current fiscal year uh, assumptions and projections we're looking for FY25 and what we identify as our major challenges going forward. We also will look at some revenue and expenditure projections and then the budget planning calendar. Again, I look. we look at this as the beginning of a long conversation that happens, that goes through next the end of, end of next or this fiscal year, uh, June 30th. Next slide. So tonight's major takeaways. Um, so the challenges that we're gonna talk about are not unique to the town of Amherst or to us. Um, the major challenges are the rising costs and the need for continued economic growth. Um, we need to continue making progress on our four major capital projects, uh, which we have been, have been identified for a very long time. We're hypersensitive to the impact of uh, increases in taxes on our, our property tax owners. Um, and we need to be balancing our new initiatives with maintaining our fiscal, our ability to pay our bills. Um, and then the, the thing for all of us, I think I can speak for the school department as well, is staff changes. Uh, there, you know, this, the interim superintendent, Doug Slaughter, who is here tonight, uh, is wearing multiple hats and carrying a lot of uh, responsibility at the school department. Uh, we have had uh, our finance director move on. So everybody in this room is, is carrying some additional weight. And just again, um, Holly and Jen have taken on the role of, of interim finance directors and doing a wonderful job. Um, the, um, I also want to talk about our financial foundation because we're in, um, we've, we've, we've done a lot. So we have a, we have a very strong financial condition. Um, we've been focused on growing our services. We have a new strategic partnership agreement with UMass and we have a strong financial foundation and that's been confirmed by our bond rating agencies. We have excellent fiscal management and forward-looking planning. This is what this is a part. We always brag about this kind of process when we meet with our bonding uh, bond raters. We have strong financial systems. Um, we have great working relationships between the library and the school and the town staffs. 
And we really work on coming up with solutions. And through this, we try to maintain sort of steady managed growth, but nothing, we don't look to grow too quickly. Next slide. So what we're gonna talk about now are the major indicators over the next um, next few slides. Um, I'm going to turn it over. So we've been doing this since 2007. So it's a, it's a practiced um, process that we follow. We update it so it's there's consistency um, from year to year, and we've refined it somewhat based on feedback from people. So we're always welcome, eager to hear from you in terms of what kind of how we can make it better. So I'm going to turn it over to Holly. Point of order before we begin. I'm so sorry. Can I get some help with Bob's um, tablet? It's projecting sound. Very. It's what there's like an echo effect. Thank you. I also want to mention that these slides will be added to the packet and made available online. They're in there now. They're there now. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, Holly. Sure. <clears throat> So as Paul said, this uh, presentation started about 15 years ago, and it is the kickoff of our budget process. Um, it does a 10-year look back on some key financial points and trends, um, both within our town and statewide, to see what, where we fall. So this first slide here is the um, sources of revenue for our general fund budget. And it just shows you um, 10 years ago in 2015, uh, you know, basically what the pieces of the pie were and what they are today. Um, like most cities and towns, our main source of revenue is property taxes. Um, the charts are very similar, but they do show that we're having a slightly larger reliance on property taxes and a little bit less on state aid and local receipts. We can go to the next slide. So these two charts show the major categories of expenditures. Um, with the uh, vast majority being made up of the town elementary school budget, the regional assessment, and the, um, the general fund, the town operating budget. Um, these percentages, again, are, are pretty similar to what they were 10 years ago. Uh, the capital piece has grown from 5% to 8%, which was a very um, intentional to uh, increase our capital spending from year to year and start planning for the four major projects. Um, the miscellaneous category has grown as well, and that is uh, due to the retirement assessment as they are looking to become, um, Hampshire County Retirement is looking to fully fund the pension um, trust fund, and we are making great strides towards our OPEP obligations as well, so that is some of the reasons why that miscellaneous category is increasing. Um, I know that we have mentioned this one in the past, and I always want to point it out. Um, where it looks like the elementary school budgets have dropped from 31% to 28% of the um, general fund budget. Part of that is due to an accounting issue and how we um, how we account for um, the charter and the school choice reimbursements um, and charges through the state aid. So that results in, that's probably at least a one to one and a half percent of that difference is simply an accounting issue that we changed. It used to be part of the elementary school budget. It's now part of the general fund budget. Uh, okay, so next slide. Good evening. Um, this slide shows property tax revenue and it uh, and it's the primary source of both operating and capital spending. Um, it includes new growth that has been averaging somewhere around $720,000 annually over the last 10 years. Um, three new building projects located at 11 East Pleasant Street, 26 Spring Street, and 133 Southeast Street will provide tax revenues of almost $300,000 for the town in FY24. Um, Annual increases are limited by Proposition 2.5 unless the town passes an operating override, which was last done in fiscal year 2011, um, with the blue line being actual dollars and the red line being constant dollars. This is adjusted for inflation. Next slide, please. Um, this slide shows a 10-year history of uncollected taxes as a percentage of the net levy. Fiscal year 2020 was slightly higher due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the town adopted an extended due date for the fourth quarter property taxes, pushing the due date from May 1st to June 30th without any penalty. And this also pushed the demand bills into July to the next fiscal year. The percent of uncollected taxes at the end of July 
was back under 2%, which is more in line with what we expect to see after that. Um, overall, the slide shows our collection rate to be very favorable to the bond rating agencies as we have remained well below the 5% or above warning indicator. Um, in addition to this low percentage of uncollected property taxes, we also, we've also collected around $168,000 in tax title money in FY23. And a tax title is a lien placed on property to enforce the collection of property taxes and is removed when the property tax account is paid in full. Next slide. Okay, so this shows our state aid, um, which is one piece of that original pie of our revenues in um, both constant dollars um, and in actual dollars and in um, constant dollars, which would be adjusted for inflation by taking the uh, CPI and, and running that out over a 10 year period. We do not have the CPI information from um, the DOR for FY23, so this stops at 2022. But if you look at this chart, it looks like our um, our state aid dollars are increasing and they are increasing, but when you adjust them for inflation, we are actually seeing um, when adjusting for inflation, lower state aid in 2022 than we had in 2014 when adjusted for inflation. Um, we will not have a look at the state's numbers um, until January. So we're being pretty cautious right now with our first draft of uh, FY25 revenues until we have a little better understanding of what state aid numbers will look like. Next slide. So the next slide also just shows the state aid as a percentage of our operating revenues. So state aid peaked for us in 2008, where we took in almost $17 million of state aid, and it was approximately 28% of our operating revenues back then. Um, there have been increases, but oftentimes what happens with those increases is that when our state aid goes up, so do our um, offsets and the, um, the next chart will show that. I'll hold that thought for one second. The next chart will show that a little bit better. Um, but right now, we're still about one percentage point lower than we were 10 years ago. Uh, 10 years ago in 2014, it was 20.5% of the operating budget. This year, it's just, our, for 2023, it was 19.4% of the operating budget. So you just it just goes to show you that we're, we're really relying a lot more on our property tax base than we are on um, state aid. So next slide. So this one here is the um, state aid history, and you'll see that the cherry the cherry sheet receipts are in red. Um, the charges are in green, and then the net state aid is the purple line um, floating up there at the top. So this shows the amount that we actually have for spending. Um, you know, again. Most of the time, an increase in state aid also comes with increase in the assessments. So that purple line is um, is basically our, our spending power there. And again, um, we'll be just waiting on the first round of governor's numbers to um, the governor's budget numbers to see where we're going to fall for our um, first estimates for FY25. Next slide. Okay, so this shows our economic growth. Um, that our economic growth revenues include meals tax, hotel, motel, um, motor vehicle excise tax, building permit fees, and our new growth. Um, as you can see on this chart, in 2023, the percentages were down from 2022. Uh, we presume that this is caused by inflation and higher interest rates, which contributes to fewer um, new vehicles purchased, which is directly ties to the amount of revenue that comes in with. Um, Gen that's generated with the excise tax. Um, also in regards to the building permits in 2022, there was a few large scale permits that were pulled. Um, and this year we had fewer large scale projects, but we did have an overall increase of the number of actual permits. Um, I, just, I just wanted to point out there as well, um, part of the drop that you're seeing there is in FY23, we had some very large transfers in and out of stabilization funds. And so that artificially increased our total operating budget. So when the total operating budget is bigger, that percentage is going to look a little bit smaller. If we were to, um, 
if we were to back out those large um, revenue and expenditures simply related to the transfers of free cash, this number would be about 4.8%. So it would be right in line with last year's. Um, but again, because of all of the transfers in and out of the stabilization funds, it made our budget look bigger than it really was, if that makes sense. So the next slide. So this chart compares our three major um, general fund revenues by showing each one again adjusted for inflation as well as in actual dollars. So the red line at the top is the property taxes and um, it is our biggest revenue source. Uh, it increases annually by the amount allowed by Proposition 2.5 as well as the addition of new growth. Um, it shows that property taxes are increasing, but when you look at them adjusted for inflation, they are not increasing nearly as much as, as we would think they, they are. Um, the middle is state aid. The, again, the green lines, our second biggest revenue source. Um, again, although this is slowly increasing um, and it is keeping a little better um, pace with inflation, we're still well below that peak um, back in 2008. Um, the last revenue shown here are our local receipts, the purple lines. Um, they have remained relatively flat and um, again, are keeping better, keeping better pace with inflation. Um, obviously, they dropped dramatically in 2021, but we are slowly getting back closer to our normal levels and uh, expect local receipts to, um, to increase in 2025 as well, hopefully. Next slide. So <clears throat> these are our operating expenditures per capita. So although our actual operating expenditures are going up, when you adjust them for inflation, they're not going up, uh, again, nearly as much. Inflation is hitting everybody, including our revenues, our expenditures, and all of our budgets. Um, so in 2022, we are actually 3.1% lower than we were in 2014, if you adjust these numbers for inflation. Um, this is a major challenge for our population numbers. Um, and our budgets. And one of the things that has always sort of been mentioned here is that um, we have um, a very unique population here in Amherst and that with the number of um, on-campus residents and off-campus residents who don't actually pay property taxes, but they are using town services. They use the roads, they use the sidewalks, the parks, the commons, public safety, et cetera, but they're not contributing as much to the, um, to the revenues of the town. Um, that has been a challenge in Amherst um, and just in terms of trying to figure creative ways to increase our tax bases. Um, and you can go to the next slide. Um, this one here compares our operating expenditures per capita to our um, peer communities. Peer communities, we began comparing Amherst to communities with similar demographics back when we started this presentation about 15 years ago. And then, um, you know, most of these communities were out east, and so people wanted some more local communities. So we had added um, the local communities. So now we show, um, we typically show both sets of these numbers when we're comparing ourselves to, to the other communities. Um, by calculating this data per capita and comparing ourselves to other communities, it makes it a little easier to interpret um, the the data in this presentation. The colors. Um, coded up here uh, show the bond ratings with the purple being AAA, blue being AA. The tan color is um, just a single A and the town of Amherst is a double A plus. We are shown in green on all of these charts for us to stand out a little bit. And then the statewide average is also shown on these charts and they are the red. Um, our spending per capita is roughly half of the statewide average currently. Um, Amherst operating expenditures per capita are still below um, all of our peer communities and the similar communities as well. Next slide. So this next slide um, depicts the budgeted municipal staffing levels for the town's general fund only. 
this does not include enterprise funds and it does not include the schools. Um, information on school staffing levels can be found on their website. Um, we have inform further information on our enterprise funds, but we've never included it in this. This presentation is, is mostly about the general fund. Um, this chart shows that over the past uh, 10 years, we've added approximately 15 FTEs or full-time equivalents. Um, there were the uh, eight crest responders that showed up here in FY23, as well as the four firefighters, which are currently shown down in the bottom in the green section that is grant funded. Um, we also have had some recent additions of positions in the last few years, such as DEI, um, communication manager, clerk of the council, some uh, p positions over the last few years here and there, but the major um, changes are the the addition of the crest in the DEI departments, as well as the four additional firefighters. Um, and next slide. <clears throat> So this chart shows our salaries compared to the overall budget and um, compared to uh, just the salaries and benefits, sorry, the salaries and benefits portions of the budget. So the bar shows our total budget salaries slowly rising, which is consistent with the prior slide. Obviously, as staffing levels go up, so will our benefits. Um, these benefits include things such as COLA steps, retirement costs, insurance, um, unemployment, life insurance, health insurance. The blue line shows salaries and benefits as a percentage of the total budget. And it has fluctuated a bit over the years, but it remains relatively flat. Um, again, you'll, you'll see that um, blue line going down just a little bit this year. And that once again is, is simply due to the fact that our budget was slightly inflated due to all those transfers in and out. So, if that had been leveled off, you would see you would see a much flatter number. It would probably be um, just above the fifty percent instead of below the fifty percent here. Um, the green line shows that benefits as a percent of just the salary and wages portion of the budget is also slowly increasing. Um, and that you will notice, I think it was in two thousand between two thousand eighteen and two thousand nineteen, where you see that green line jump from <clears throat> just below. 40 million to above 40 million. That was when our um, we changed from being self-insured um, to fully insured, and we moved to the Maya program. Um, it did result in some higher rates for us, but some much more stable and um, much less volatile um, worries there. Um, next slide. So this slide shows our debt service. Um, this is our annual debt expense as a percent of our operating net revenue. These are our annual principal and interest payments on existing debt. Um, because our debt expense is low currently at 0.8%, um, we have greater flexibility to issue new debt. And debt continues to drop. And a reason for this is borrowing for central fire station repairs, road paving, and Kiris, which was a CPA project were all paid off in fiscal year 23. New debt will start hitting in the next couple of years for debt debt authorizations approved through the capital improvement plan and debt service is part of the capital budget. Next slide. So this slide shows us compared to other communities throughout Massachusetts above and compares us to our neighboring communities below for debt service as a percentage of the operating budget. This will look different in the next few years as more debt is taken on with a few of the big projects underway. Our credit rating is strong due to a low percentage of debt relative to the general fund revenue and also to good fiscal management. Next slide. Amherst long-term debt load has remained relatively low and has actually decreased in recent years as shown in this slide. This percentage includes both long-term and short-term outstanding debt. This chart does not show authorized but unissued debt like the Jones Library, the new elementary school, fire pumper truck, and fire ladder truck. Once these items are borrowed for, our outstanding debt will reflect an increase in percentage. Uh, next slide. This is a comparison to other communities in Massachusetts. 
above and below a comparison to our neighboring communities, showing what our outstanding debt is as a percentage of assessed value for fiscal year 21. Um, the state data lags a few years, so this was the most recent information we could provide. Um, these charts are long-term outstanding debt only. Currently, Amherst is the lowest, but again, this will change as we take on more debt in the next few years. And again, we maintain, maintain a strong AA plus credit rating as a result of this low percentage of debt relative to our general fund revenue. Next slide. The town continues to make progress on its long-term liabilities. Um, our pension, which is the blue or purple line there, um, is at 78.6 funded with a fully funded date estimated to be in 2033. And our, the change in percentage from 2020 to 2022, that increase is due to favorable market performance. Um, We've been working on some different scenarios for the OPEB funding plan and continue to make annual payments, but the most significant change will be in 2033 once our pension liability is met and we can redirect funds to it. Next slide. Oh. I just wanted to mention on that last slide that the, um, the OPEB and the actuary studies are only done once every two years. So 2022 is the most recent data that we have they'll do an interim update in between and update some of the numbers, but they don't update everything again until 2024. Yeah. Right. So our current financial policies recommend our reserves to be between five and 15%. And as you can see, we're over at over 25%. Exceeding the reserve ceiling is intentional. Um, general reserves, which is free cash, which is the red line and general stabilization being the green line combined are around 16% with the rest for capital stabilization recently voted by the town council for FY23 to help offset the costs of the major capital projects we are facing, including debt service and our commitment to continue to fund the reparations fund. Having good reserves provides the town with greater flexibility to react to any loss of revenue, such as state aid cuts and unforeseen emergencies um, like we just went through with the pandemic. So I just wanted to mention here as well that um, we were not able to do a 2024 number because we've not brought those financial orders to the town council yet um, on what may or may not be used from free cash. So I, I certainly have some estimates. We can discuss those things um, both with the finance committee and with the town council um, later, but those orders will be coming um, later on tonight. So 2024 numbers, we struggled with whether to put them up there or not put them up there, but at this point, they were all just sort of going to be estimates, so there'll be a lot of discussion around that, I'm sure, but um, we typically are a year behind on this slide anyways, because you never know when your free cash is going to be certified and how much of it is going to be used. All right. So um, this slide shows that the town does very well compared to other municipalities above and neighboring communities below with reserves as the percentage of the operating budget. Next slide. So this comes back to me now. Thank you. But we, we, we got more coming. Um, so first off, I want to mention what OPEP means. Many people don't know what OPEP means. It's other post-employment benefits. Basically, it's the promise we make to, to employees that we will continue to contribute to their health insurance after they've retired. So we make that commitment to current employees. We are pre-funding that as required by, um, by our auditors and by accounting principals. Uh, it takes time. The strategy is to get full funding of our pension liability and then to take the money that we've been putting into that and to put that into our health insurance OPEB liability. So it takes decades to do this, um, but it's the right thing to be doing. Um, so what you heard is, or especially the last few slides, is a purposeful explanation of why we have done of our strategy for building our big capital projects. Uh, Jen talked about the debt rolling down, that our, we have a very low debt load, a very low debt load right now because we're, we have very few outstanding balances. That's a good thing. Um, we have 
you've seen the increase in our free cash and our capital reserves and our and um, stabilization funds. That's purposeful. So we build up our savings account in essence. So we have money to 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 help pay things off. Um, you'll see later that we are we continue to create room within the operating budget to put money towards capital expenses so we can pay things off and we're not struggling to cut um, things in our operating budget versus paying off our debt. So all those things. And then, um, so those are the real um, key things. And then also we have the strategic strategic use of debt exclusions like we've done with the school, uh, the, the elementary school. So that's all part of the plan for how we build up our um, reserves and, and pay off our debt so we can take on these new capital projects, which we uh, needed a long time ago. Um, and also you'll notice in this presentation that multi, many of our measures show population as a metric. It's not the best pop, the best metric for us because our population is skewed with a lot of students. So we have a 40,000 person population, but we're a much smaller town in, re, in reality, but it's the metric that we've used. And so you, we would, you would expect us to be lower on many of those, on those metrics. The other thing is that we try to use um, numbers and ratios that, anybody can go to the state website and get. So you can validate all this information if you want. So it's it's consistent from year to year. You know, uh, Holly and Jen said, what has been updated on the state website? Because we wait until the website is updated versus us going and trying, talking to different treasurers and collectors and comptrollers and saying, what are you doing? We want it all to be standardized. So these are, you know, we talked about our bond rating. Double uh, A plus is a is a very good bond rating for us. It's a we we have really worked hard over the last couple of years to move it up even higher. The better your bond rating, the lower the interest rates that you pay for bonding is. We are um, it, we struggle to increase ours because with our large population, it also shows a. a demographic that is low, lower in income. So when they're looking at a town like Weston, they'll say, oh, there's a huge amount of ability to pay for a town of Weston because the average household income is very large, whereas our average household income is low. We've made the pitch to the bond rating agencies that you shouldn't look at the student, you should look at the student's family who might have much more buying power because that's what they bring to the town. It's not just the student's income that you should be looking at but it's the uh, the student's family. They have not really bought into that. We've made the pitch once. We're gonna keep making that pitch to them in hopes that they say, ah, you actually are undervalued. And so that, that's one of the things that we're working on in terms of our bond rating. But given everything, our AA plus is really a pretty, pretty strong rating for us. And it was reaffirmed last year, I think it was when they reaffirmed it, which was uh, a lot of it had to do with our financial situation, which you just looked at. And they look at all these things. And also with our management's um, financial policies, the way we've, um, how, how we've managed in the staffing, they meet all of our staff and things like that. Um, and the second thing we talk about um, our health reserves, um, which is our free cash plus our stabilization funds. Oops, let me go back. We're not, um, so as Holly said, the, it says 24 million, 26%. That's last year's number because we, again, the council hasn't acted on these new actions that we're presenting to you tonight. So we haven't updated that. That'll be updated once the council takes action on the things that you've been requested to do tonight. Um, the big thing for us is we created the capital stabilization fund, and that was a significant um, statement by the council to say, yes, we're saving money for these projects. It's not just random why we're, why we're building these reserves. It was communicated to the public why we're building them. It's, it's to pay off these capital projects. And then the council also created the reparation stabilization fund to help address that goal. So we are starting to put money aside in advance uh, to start to meet the goal that the council set uh, for reparations. Next slide. So one of the um, things that I talked a little bit about this is that one of the things we really pride ourselves on is that um, we're all on the same team, the library, the schools, the town, we communicate well, we share the resources that we, that we bring in. Um, we're, we, and that's one of the strengths that we bring when we talk to our ratings agency is that there aren't, there aren't these 
bitter battles um, that you see in many communities over funding and things like that. We communicate. This is one of the first, very few communities do what we're doing right now, where everybody, all the elected officials come into one room and they share the information. Um, the um, We're projecting a 3% increase in operating budgets this year. Um, we built that in this year, and we'll, we'll address this, the, what we're doing at FY25 in a minute. Um, we continue to invest more in our capital and sustainability efforts. And then the other thing that the council will be looking at later on tonight is um, the council had wanted to include four new firefighters into the, into the operating budget. We initially funded those with uh, ARPA funds. With the strategic partnership agreement with UMass, we now have an outside funding source that lets us integrate those four positions into our operating budget, which is a very good thing. It's, not, it's, um, it's important piece there. The challenges, you're gonna hear about inflation, 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 it's there, it's happening. Um, and it's happening on all, when we buy vehicles, when we're negotiating collective bargaining agreements, when we're buying buildings, all those things. Um, we continue to um, do well in our major industry for the town, which is housing. There are, there's a, a incredible demand in, for, for housing and you see new buildings going up in, in key areas and that's generating more income. I think, as Jennifer said, you know, 300, these, those three new buildings are generating $300,000 in new revenue to the town um, every year. And so that's money that goes into our operating funds that helps us pay for the services that the town would like. Uh, we also uh, need two more strategic partnership agreements. We've got one with UMass, we need one with Hampshire, and we need one with Amherst College. Those are challenges that we are, are really driving towards right now. Next slide. So um, as we move into our FY25 um, assumptions, these are the revenue projections that we're, we're looking at. Um, the two and a half percent, we always get two and a half percent property tax increase that goes up. It doesn't mean everybody's individual property tax bill goes up two and a half percent. It's an overall, overall calculation, but we can raise our property, the income we get from property tax by two and a half percent um, townwide. We also budget a number for $650,000 for new growth. New growth, um, is there, what is um, anything that you, if you have a new building, you put it, an addition onto your house, that's called new growth. We can add that to our tax base. So any new construction, any any new additions that people have, you put in a swimming pool, things like that, that's a taxable and thing that we add on. Uh, state aid is flat. Uh, we are constantly arguing for more money at the state level. Uh, I used to work at the Massachusetts Municipal Association called the MMA. And the nickname for the MMA was more money always. And that's how we took the, the message to the state house. Um, we're starting to see local receipts re come back to a more normal level compared to the pandemic. We really reduced local receipts dramatically because that's what was happening in the world. Um, and then one of the things that we do is we have enterprise funds. Enterprise funds are basically separate businesses that operate um, with their own funding source. That's our water department, our sewer department, transportation, which is downtown parking and solid waste. Uh, which is the transfer station. And we and we collect revenue from those things and then we account for them separately. In addition to that, we ask those enterprise funds to pay for the services that they get from the town government. You know, So like Holly's time or Jen's time, we collect the money. And so during the pandemic, we reduced that um, those funds that came to the town. We've re re gone back with water and sewer. That's been back to normal. And this year, transportation's back to normal. We have not, we don't collect it from solid waste. It's a very small fund. Uh, and again, just an important thing, other communities are looking for overrides. The town of Amherst is not looking for an override uh, for uh, an operating budget. Next slide. So working assumptions for FY25, and this is this is sort of the, the major thing. Um, last year at this point, we were looking at a two and a half percent increase in our operating budget. This year, we're saying 3%. We're confident in our numbers and our, our growth, our new growth that we believe. And we also know that the expenses of, of our departments are increasing through um, uh, collective bargaining agreements. And so we're going to start at 3% and hope we can do better. Um, but I think that's a, a good place for us to begin our, our conversation. Uh, as we enter FY25, um, we have a number of contracts that are unsettled. When we have settled contracts, that gives us predictability in what our labor costs are going to be. Um, 
the town, we have a blessed moment for a few months where we have all of our con labor contracts settled. Um, the fire department comes up on July 1. So we were, we just finished settling all our last two contracts and within a month, we'll be back at the table again. The bad news for us tonight is what we're projecting for health insurance. We're, we've been informed uh, and we don't, we won't get that percentage increase until January. Um, but we've ex been told to expect the worst. Um, and so we're budgeting, encouraging the other departments to budget 12% increase. Um, it's a large increase for us and it's a major piece of our budget. Uh, and that will eat up a lot of our increases that we're, we're able to put to together. And that's one of the reasons we want to go to 3% because it is a significant increase. We hope that that number will come down. We'll work at doing making modifications if we can to our plans to bring that number down. Um, but we will have more certainty about that about the third week of January when we get our rates. Okay, so um, the I think we talked a little bit about our retirement assessments. We're looking at that going up 7% um, to meet our commitment to the Hampshire County Retirement System. We're hoping to maintain our capital investment at 10.5%. We moved from 10% last year to 10.5% this year. We wanna maintain that because that's important as we continue to meet the backlog of, of capital needs that we have. And we're going to continue to make a, a, a modest increase to our OPEB contribution, $50,000 to bring it to $600,000. It's not an enormous amount of money, but it's important for the rate. The rating agencies really like to see that even in hard times, we're making commitments to make, to look at our long-term liabilities. So the fact that we've done this every year is really um, significant in, when we, they look at us. Next slide. So we asked the, the major challenges for each of the uh, three um, entities here. And so again, for us, for the town of Amherst, it's the facility and, and infrastructure needs, uh, getting more economic development, um, the uncertainty, we're, we're pretty confident that things are coming out in a, in a good way, but there's still uncertainty we know, with inflation coming forward, um, our health insurance costs. Is, costs um, and then we're seeing major new buildings be, being built, but they're not huge consumers of water and sewer. They're very, very efficient. The university is, is really much more efficient as is the college. So we're not getting the level of revenue. It's a good thing, but it means our revenue isn't coming in. We're, we're producing the same amount. It costs the same whether you do one gallon or 10 gallons of water, basically. For the schools, um, and Doug has told, you know, the, the big challenge is the uh, moving off of the federal funding ESSER funds because that's been stabilizing the schools and that's going to end and managing that transition. Uh, some people call it the fiscal cliff, but it's it's a, something that we'll be working towards. Facility needs at the schools are, are clear. We can't get the new school soon enough. Uh, state aid, um, the funding for federal grants and state grants, and then planning for the transition of the sixth grade to the middle school. Those are the major school things. Uh, for library, uh, Sharon shared that was diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts, the needs of the facility, um, and the reduced reliance on the endowment, which is a, a goal of the trustees. Excellent. So going forward, um, we're going to be talking about, these sort of redundant actually, isn't it? Um, uh, the key thing for me, though, is the on, our, on the concerns is maintaining our fiscal discipline. And what that means is um, trying to manage our head count. You know, it's called, we call it position control. We are very judicious about adding positions. When there's a major initiative that the council really wants, then we, we, we integrate that into the budget, but we try to really manage those, that head count because that head count comes with it. OPEB liabilities, health insurance costs, and pension liabilities. We all, that all gets calculated into our number. So maintaining that kind of fiscal discipline is really important. Main, moving forward on our four major capital projects, but also figuring out and sharing with the public how these are things are going to be paid for. Um, we know right away, I mean, hear it every day, the needs of our departments outweigh the resources that we have. And um, and there isn't, it, it's just, a, uh, it, it doesn't move, it's the way it is. And then we also clearly, um, everything looks through the lens of the impact on our taxpayers because taxes are high in the town of Amherst, um, but you get a lot of services by working for the town. Um, 
So the other th slide is just how we try to get more things, you know, more money into our system. Development is important. Getting grants is important. Uh, getting money from our nonprofit partners is important. Using reserves at key times is important. Uh, and then we, as we make changes on sustain sustainability efforts, we tend to, we start to have savings in our operating costs. And that's a good thing for all of us. Next slide. So this is a, a spreadsheet that no one can really see probably, but it'll be in the packet and you can study it. But this is, you will see this many times over the course of the coming months. It's something that we update regularly. Um, and um, do you wanna go through it, Holly, or just sort of identify that it exists? This is just sort of, again, our first draft of, um, an FY25 budget, like Paul said, we're going to go through it again and again and again and refine it and, um, you know, add things and take things away and, and balance things as governor's numbers come out. Um, but so the first page shows uh, basically the sources of revenues. And then the second page is the, um, the expenditures. And when all is said and done, we'll be looking for a balanced budget. Right now, there is a shortfall, there is a deficit. But what we are hoping is that with increases in state aid and um, hopefully being able to increase some local receipts that we won't have a problem, um, you know, filling that gap in and getting it to a balanced budget. You know, again, this is just draft one. Um, there's still a lot of information that will need to be, um, you know, gathered and analyzed and, and state aid numbers um, coming from the state in January as our first guest will give us a little clearer direction on, on where we're headed. So, th so this snapshot tells us we're with the assumptions we just shared with you, we, pl we plant that onto the spreadsheet. It shows us a $281,000 deficit that we would have to make up before the council could approve a budget or I can deliver a budget that has to be balanced. So this is the first stab at it. And we will be looking at all these numbers as we go forward and, and, um, checking them and reality testing them. And then Athena is gonna walk us through where we are in the process and where we're going. So quickly, like Paul said, tonight is the kind of kickoff of the budget season. We are going to, um, the finance committee for the town council is gonna turn around with this information and begin developing the budget guidelines for the coming year. Um, we plan to have a council vote on the budget guidelines before the end of the year on December 18. Um, the budget public forum is coming up at the next council meeting on the 20th. Um, like I said, the budget guidelines adopt on December 18 for the town council. And then in the new year, in the spring, uh, the Community Preservation Act Committee will be finalizing their recommendations for CPA projects and presenting those to the council. Um, and then later in the spring, the regional school budget will come to the council and be referred to finance committee um, and then on through the year with the manager's presentation of the budget and so on. That concludes our presentation. Thank you. Uh, before we go to questions, I'd like to note that uh, Nika Lopes, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. And the minutes should show that Anika joined us somewhere around 6.40 or so. Nobody particularly noticed. Thank you. Um, are there questions from, we have no public comment. Are there questions from the various groups, boards, uh, et cetera, that have been gathered? Please use the raise hand function. Jennifer. Jennifer Shaw from the school committee. Thank you. Um, I think it was Holly in the pie chart page you mentioned the change from moving charter and choice from the school budget to, to the general fund budget and that the change between, that's why the numbers looked so different. One of the reasons between 2015 and 2024, when did that change first, when, when did you make the change? Last year. No. I'm looking to Doug and I'm looking to Andy. Um, I'm I'm going to have to double check on that. It was, I want to say it was about three or four years ago. I don't think it was last year. Do it more? Okay. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll check on that one for you. Thank you. Okay. 
uh, Bernie Kubiak, who's a member of the Finance Committee. Thank you, Lynn. Um, I'll mention that uh, fiscal discipline is an important factor, but he limited his comment to headcount. And I would argue that fiscal di di discipline goes far beyond headcount. Uh, I think as we move forward, we have to be very careful about new initiatives, spending. Uh, people may have to trim back on their wish lists. Uh, we're, we're in good shape, but we're certainly not out of the woods. And uh, there have been mistakes made in the past. We shouldn't have to expect to pay for those mistakes. Keep in mind, we have two critical needs in terms of capital projects that have not been addressed. The fire department and the Department of Public Works. Both those departments affect public safety. And we need to be careful because every dollar we spend somewhere else is a dollar we take away from those two very essential projects. And uh, uh, that would be my, my message. And that so the fiscal discipline, when you look at discipline means asking yourself, do we really need to do this? Uh, I know it's a favorite project but, or a favorite idea, but do we really need to do this? And keep in mind those two very uh, critical capital uh, issues. Thanks. Thank you. Town Councilor Anna Devlin Gothier. Anna. <laughs> uh, thank you all so much. Um, so, my question, I think, is I'm going to just kind of put it out to all of you and see who wants to respond. I'm really intrigued by the slide that had the per capita uh, operating budget and compared to relative towns. Um, and I'm I'm curious about, I, I know that we always are presented with that slide like it's a good thing. And I understand why we're presented with that slide like it's a good thing. But for me, that slide is actually really worrying. And because I, I worry that we aren't, um, that we're burning out people if it's on people, um, that we are understaffed, right? If it's again, salary takes up a big chunk of this. And so I'm curious if you have a more broken down analysis in comparison to the state or other towns in terms of where we are underspending comparatively and where we're over, if we're overspending anywhere. Um, so I'm curious about this in terms of capital spending, but also uh, if we're able to break it down, you know, looking at areas of the way our budget gets broken down. Um, and I know that that's not a perfect formula because everybody does their government slightly differently, but if there is a way to kind of look a little bit more detailed versus just operating, um, I'd really like to see that. And, and it relates to my second question, which is um, about the compensation study, which I believe Paul is, is currently in yeah. process. And I'd like to kind of pair those things together. And uh, if, if this is ever something that can come back to us to see, um, I'd like to see that kind of in wrapped up in that as well, if possible. Sure. I can take that. So, so you're, you're right that every, every, when we try to do comparisons across towns, every town does things differently. Um, we That's why we try to tag it to what the Department of Revenue requests in terms of reporting, but it's not perfect. Um, you know, our library has its own endowment fund. Other, other communities don't, don't have that. Um, you know, and we may have different things under public safety that other communities don't count as public safety. So it's not a really, you have to really dig into and say head to head, tell us what you're looking at. And that takes time and, and money for someone to do that. Um, in terms of the classification compensation study, that is in process. Um, I know they're, they're chewing up all the information um, in terms of what it looks like for our non-union employees. Non-union employees have not had a look at their positions for a very long time. So that's what this is all that what that that's what that's about. Thank you. And I think to to kind of relate why um I'm I am thinking about staff burnout, right? We've seen a lot of turnover recently and we know it's more expensive to hire people than to retain them. And so, you know, thinking about how we can make sure that we're we're building budgets and and planning in a way that helps us to retain the, the staff we have. And so I think that the studies you're doing will will be helpful for that. Thanks. Before I go on, I just want to note for any of you that are here for the regular town council meeting we are still in the indicator financial indicators meeting the regular town council meeting will pick up after that with a hearing that is scheduled at 7 15 which will be as soon as we can get to it okay mandy johanneke counselor thank you um one observation and two questions the observation goes back to the state aid 
um, over the course of a decade, it has decreased on an actual dollar basis. And that is not anything the three of you can do anything about. I know that, but we have Mindy in the audience here. <laughs> and so I, I would like Mindy to take a hard look at that number compared to other numbers and think about why we have such a budget crunch in this town and in other towns and in schools throughout the municipalities in this state. And part of it is the fact that our state aid in 2007 covered nearly 30% of our budget, and now it only covers less than 20. Um, and even just a decade ago on actual dollars, it was 14 million, and now it's 13 and a half million. Um, that's a problem. So that's my observation. Um, and that's a lot of the root of maybe many of our budget crunches. Uh, two questions. Um, the first one is the 3% increase that is projected in financial indicators across the board. Um, what is your rough estimate of how much of that increase every year, percentage-wise or dollar-wise, goes to contracted salary increases for our employees. Um, you know, I, I know salaries, one of the charts showed salaries are about 50% of costs, but um, I'm curious as to the increase each year, how much really goes to, it is just by contract, keeping up with salaries and our contractual obligations with salary and COLA increases. And the second question is, I noticed um, there's been a lot of quote you know, towns don't profit, but a lot of um, large revenue profit every year in the last couple of fiscal years. I think 20, you know, in, when you go to that last slide, um, that bottom line, or that's not the last slide, slide 33, the surplus was 4.9 million in 2021, 4.6 million in 2022, 6.1 million in 2023. Has there ever been an analysis done over the last five years as to what is causing or why we have those surpluses and whether that is a result of us underestimating revenues or us overestimating expenditures such that those surpluses could be potentially um, allocated towards additional expenditures within the budget for other more people or other programs. Mm -hmm. So on the contracted increases, we can share with you what the contracts, what the contracted agreements are with our unions. That's public information. They're on our website and, but we can share that. I think most of them are, you know, there's the COLA, then there are other things that get built into a contract. Typically they're in the two and a half percent range for the most part, 2% sometimes. Um, and then for the, where, where that surplus comes from or whatever, you know, where free cash gets built from, we can give you a calculation of what that is. It's always a combination of, and we do a good job at underestimating our um, revenue and well, what, no, we're underestimating or whatever it is. We're <laughs> making sure we come underneath the budget and we and that we're bringing in more money than we project we will. So that that when we are achieve that, that means there's a what you call profit. It's really we don't want to be you know, say we're going to bring in a million dollars and bring in 800,000. That's a problem. We never want to be in that situation. So we're very conservative about that. Sometimes things happen that um, that bring in a lot of revenue. Say a large facility gets it brings in a lo very large building permit fee. That's not something that we build into our budget on an ongoing basis because that's a one-time event. And then it falls to free cash and sh it shows up there in free cash. So, but it's usually, it's, it's usually a combination of both and we can sort of ID where that comes from. Councillor Pam Bruni. Thank you. I really, really appreciate the work that goes into this. Uh, and I especially like the the comparisons with the other communities. So I it occurred to me as I was watching through each of those um, related slides is that the only one that does not compare Amherst to the other communities was the staffing levels. And I think that would be something that I would find of interest. I think that would be informative and um, and just to understand, are we are are we way above the average, or or how do we stand in terms of staffing? Does it mean that we try to take on too much, and need more staff to accomplish all of our exciting goals? Um, and then uh, Mandy Joe actually asked the questions that I had about the free cash and how to how to perhaps better. Um, 
narrow the gap or or if we or if we um, want to continue with this practice that perhaps there is also an estimate or excuse me a proposal of what we might do with the free cash ahead of time so that there are some clear priorities being set for any free cash that does get generated rather than the discussion that we're going to have tonight which is going to be a little bit more what do we do with some random you know distribution of money so thank you School committee member, Katie Lesdowski. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for the comprehensive explanation. My question is simply, what is the basis for choosing the communities in which we're comparing ourselves or in which those that are focused on the slides? And I'm, I'm just curious about what parameters are used to select those particular towns. Someone can address that. Thank you. So initially it was, uh, there's a UMass study that looked at communities like Amherst that had similar demographics, similar budget size, things like that. And that was the, the and I think Holly said, those were the communities that tended to be in Eastern Massachusetts because there aren't a lot of communities like Amherst in Western Massachusetts. But for, as the decision makers had this, would look at that information, they would say, well, I know about East Hampton, I know about Northampton or Greenfield or, or what, what are our neighboring property, neighboring communities doing on those same metrics? So I don't know, three or four years ago, Holly, we said, let's tell us the communities you want us to include. And we created a second chart that included all of our neighboring communities. Um, and we put that information. It's there. Many of them aren't comparable to us because they have different types of operations, but it is how people um, look at things. When you're a decision maker, you may have somebody who lives in Hadley. So you know what their, what their operations look like and you can see what they're doing. So the initial take was based on a um, the people who had done the initial study for the town. Okay. Um, taking my turn as a counselor, uh, one of the things that strikes me as we look at the additional money called, quote, free cash, none of which is free and none of which is cash, um, the, that we actually um, think about maybe we are at a point where we should increase the percentage we're putting into capital and or we do have staff needs. And I keep hearing about staff needs every day. So that's one, one just observation. Another observation is as we continue to uh, prepare and try to make the case state level uh, regarding pilot payments from both public institutions as well as private institutions, it would be interesting to look at a chart similar to those communities where we compare, where we pick the ones that have uh, the 29 public higher education institutions and also concentrations of large numbers of higher education, higher education institutions using something like student enrollment or something. Because my guess is that we begin to see a trend in those communities as well as we compare to others where your per capita expenditures are uh, lower than they are in communities that do not have all of that land that is not taxed. Um, I have many other questions, but this is just the beginning. So, Andy? Yeah, um, I appreciate all of the comments and I waited until towards the end of the process to raise my hand because I, uh, wanted to reflect on sort of my own experience, having been probably along with Doug Slaughter um, involved with town finances in Amherst longer than anyone else in the room. And uh, so um, recognizing that we were both on the finance committee back in the town meeting days. And uh, so a couple things that I wanted to just mention, this question that Mandy raised and has been talked about a little bit about um, budgeting and the budgeting philosophy um, is not new. I mean, it's really been talked about every year. Should we uh, spend more money and live at a higher risk? And, uh, you know, each year we come to the same conclusion that Paul mentions, which is that uh, our bond rating and our sanity will be uh, totally turned upside down if we make a mistake and go the other direction. Mm -hmm. 
But the other thing is that um, the ability to have the free cash to transfer for other uses at the end of the year um, does have some value. And uh, it is something that the council is going to be talking about, about including um, a substantial addition to, for example, uh, roads and repair of roads, which uh, we have the ability had the ability to do last year, and hopefully we'll have the ability to do this year. Um, other things that I thought about was this um, question of the increase in state aid, which never matches um, inflation, and therefore when you get to the actual dollars, has negative slope. And I think that that is really something that has always concerned all of us. And, um, the um, I think that we, we look at state aid, we have to remember that the importance of state aid really started in 1980 when um, the uh, voters passed Proposition 2.5, as it is known, or, and uh, it limited increases to an amount that, um, in the best of times, just matches inflation and uh, that we counted on state aid to make up the difference and to keep towns financially healthy. And state aid get, it became increasingly important. Um, and I've always been concerned that uh, when we, if we got into a period of higher inflation, as we have since the pandemic, uh, that the two and a half would not work anymore. Um, and that the legislature was under the same pressures. So um, again, there's an historical context to that. Um, the uh, last two things that I just wanted to mention is, is that there's a lot of information available uh, about all cities and towns in comparison of all cities and towns that people can find to work with themselves by looking at the state website for under Department of Revenue Division of Local Services. And um, they put out just a tremendous number of different charts that you can look at, as does the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education for Schools, uh, because uh, a number of people um, regularly look at that one for how many dollars are spent per district, in each district per student. And, uh, so I just wanted to point people in that direction, which gets to my final point, which is that I've wanted to look at something that I think is a financial indicator that we never thought about um, looking at. And it's just become a much more of a discussion as of late. Um, but the percentage of property within the town of Amherst that is um, residential, commercial, and industrial, that um, in comparison to other towns, we are very low on commercial and industrial, and therefore the percentage is much higher on residential. And um, that um, has a tremendous effect on options that are available to us. And uh, I am looking at that comparison a little more and encourage that we give some thought to that is being recognized as part of our uh, financial analysis. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dorothy Pam. Uh, I note, I wrote in my notes that you don't have any charts that show authorized but not borrowed money for the Jones and the fire pumper. And I can understand why you might not have them because they haven't been um, borrowed yet. However, I think we'd like to see that. So are, is it, are we going to see such a graph or um, later to, today, tonight? We don't have anything prepared for that. We certainly know what the numbers are and how much authorized and unissued debt we have, which I believe right now is about $164 million, which is a really big number, but all of that debt will not um, necessarily be issued. Some of those um, some of those projects, like the Jones Library, 
the full amount of the project has to be authorized, but that doesn't mean that's exactly what we're going to spend. So that number is um, is is not really a great metric because it it doesn't necessarily mean that we're running out the door and borrowing one hundred and sixty four million dollars next year. That could be over time. Those numbers could change. Those projects could come in lower higher, God forbid, um, or, or whatnot. So we don't have anything prepared for that, but we certainly can um, can break that down for you. We okay. have it in all sorts of reports. <laughs> Thank you. It would be very good because if you're a visual thinker, um, it would be helpful to see them with the other charts and graphs. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Kathy Shane. I may be the last person, so I will really try to be brief. Um, I just want to um, expand a little bit on a couple points that Andy, first Mandy, then Andy made. Andy, we do have an industrial base. It's called education. It just we can't tax it. Uh -huh. So our three, our major industry right. are in terms of major employers. I mean, whatever you think about them, someone else might have a factory. We have a pretty big education factory. So. It's something I think there's no way of capturing. You captured it when you went quickly through it, Holly, that how much of what might in other places be a tax base is not a tax base. And this really was brought home to me when we were looking at uh, the carrying costs when we went out to the community for the new elementary school. And there's this great little state tool. that can say, if you need a million dollars, plug in your town, divide it by the people and in Northampton, we were dividing it by twice as many taxable units as in our town, and we have about the same population. And I mean, it was really startling to see you divide by 6,500 versus 12,000. So what are, we have a base that has to carry a lot. The other thing I wanted to say on the decline of state as a share, which Randy said, this was this started back in the 70s too. The federal government cut down to states, states cut down, we decreased income taxes, which were a very equitable way of collecting money. So there's there's been a push down to the property tax level that has been an ongoing thing, which I personally think we need to reverse at some point, and that we rely on our state reps to start thinking about that. Mindy's going to be sorry she attended. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to thank you all. You did a phenomenal job, and I know it's been without Sean, but you know what? He picked well mm -hmm. because you're all doing a terrific job, and we really appreciate what you've come forward with tonight. I'm going to ask each of the committees to adjourn their group. Uh, we'll start with Jennifer Shaw for the school committee. Amherst School Committee is now adjourned. Uh, Austin Surratt for the Jones Library Trustees. Jones Library Trustees meeting is adjourned. Andy Steinberg, Finance Committee. Finance Committee is adjourned. And before I adjourn the town council meeting, if any of you that are staying here for the, the next part of the meeting, the regular meeting of the town council, please move to the audience. And if you're part of presenting at some point, we'll ask you to come up as well. Okay. Uh, the town council meeting is adjourned, but we will immediately... I'm, I'm sorry, the special meeting of the town council is adjourned and we will immediately move into the regular town council meeting, although we have a moment to shift. No.
Uh, Athena, would you please take the screen down so I can see people? It is hard to explain. This is, uh, in, uh, uh, we're going to leave Austin in the room, uh, but we should put Gabrielle Weaver in the audience. Coming in the morning. And Katie Lesdowski needs to be moved into the Thank audience. You. Okay, we're going to proceed with our meeting. So close, so close. Yeah. Um, so good evening. It is still November 13th. And this is the second meeting of two meetings tonight. This is a regular meeting of the town council. And we will begin by just saying the open meeting law allows us to do this in a hybrid mode. I will be making sure that all members of the council can hear us and we can hear them. Um, this meeting is also available by Zoom, by phone, and as a live broadcast on Amherst Media Channel 9. Um, so given that we have a quorum of the council present, I'm calling the regular meeting of the town council to order at 724. I'm gonna call on councilors again to make sure you can hear us and we can hear them. Shalini Balmilne. Present. Pat DeAngelis. Present. Anna Devlin Gothier. Present. Lynn Griesmer is present. Mandy Johanneke. Present. Anika Lopes. Present. Michelle Miller is absent. Dorothy Pam. Here. Pam Rooney. Here. Kathy Shane. Here. Andy Steinberg. Present. Jennifer Taub is absent. And Alicia Walker. Here. Thank you. Um, there, I want to note for the public that there are three public comment periods during this meeting. The first is related to a hearing on tax rates for the coming year. And so we will only accept public comment regarding that at that time. The second is general public comment. And that's for anybody who would like to say anything to the council within the time limit we allow. And the third is particularly in related, related to the proposed Jones Library increase in bond authorizing. So with that, we are going to begin with the announcement. Yes, I'm sorry. If you would like to speak at any point during the public comment periods, any of the three, please, and you're in the room, please make sure you see Athena. I will be asking for hands of people on Zoom later, okay? Um, on the agenda for this evening, we've listed various meetings. I just want to note that next Monday night, uh, the town council will actually convene at five o'clock. It's a very boring period because basically we spend about an hour and a half reading the town manager evaluations and the draft. And so there's actually nothing going on, but we have to be in public meeting. Um, at 6.30, we will begin with a public forum on the FY25 budget. We mentioned that earlier. And at seven o'clock, we will be also have another public forum on the supplemental budget and the bond authorization regarding the library. 
the regular town council meeting will resume after the seven o'clock public forum. We have two other council meetings scheduled through the end of this term, December 4th and December 18th. All of our committees are extremely busy and I particularly wanna make note that each of them is trying to, fig to finish up whatever they need to get done before the end of this term and also prepare their carryover memos. Uh, the finance committee in particular is meeting twice this week, once on November 14th at one o'clock and once on November 17th at one o'clock. Um, with that, we're going to move into the hearing. Um, it was scheduled for 7.15. This, and I'm going to declare that the hearing is now officially open. I'm going to ask Kim Yu, our principal assessor, to please come forward and make a presentation. And I want to make note that Nick Grabe, who is a member of our board of assessors, is with us in the audience. Two other people help are on that committee with uh, Nick and they are Richard Morris and Ken Hargraves. So we will have public comment after the presentation and then counselor comments and then close the hearing. Kim, welcome back again. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. A little closer? Okay, is that better? That's much better. Okay. All right, so um, we can go right into the next slide. Um, and what we're going to talk about tonight are, these are what we're going to vote on. So we're going to vote whether we have a single or a split tax rate. We're going to vote on an open space discount, a small commercial exemption, and the residential exemption. We can go to the next slide, please. This is just a little history of why we're doing this tonight. Um, so in 1978, uh, the state decided that municipalities needed to classify their um, classes in residential, commercial, industrial, and personal property. Um, so the DOR has all of our rules and regulations that we set, and then we bring it to you for approval. Next slide, please. This was something that I went over last year, but I just want to briefly touch on these again. So this is just a quick uh, definition of each of our classes. So the residential class is anything uh, that you can live in, basically. Um, this also includes uh, accessory land um, buildings, such as garages, sheds. Um, this would include things such as tennis courts, pools, um, so on and, and so forth. Um, this is single family homes all the way up to any type of apartment building. So two families, three families, um, condos. As for commercial, this would be anything um, such as office buildings, stores, banks. Um, this does include vacant land as well. Um, and this also includes our farms. So all of our farmland that um, serves vegetables, um, tobacco, so on and so forth, as well as our recreational land. So we have our, um, our land that's left of its natural state, our hiking trails, things to that nature. Um, industrial properties is anything that's manufacturing. Um, this also includes um, our solar. And then with personal property, basically, if you were to lift a building off the ground, anything that would fall out, desks, computers, <laughs> chairs, um, refrigeration, uh, you know, any of that sort of thing uh, would be considered part of our personal property. Next slide, please. So this is just a pie chart to show you the distribution of our town. So we are 89% residential. Um, our commercial comes in second at 6.2%. Our personal property is at 4.4%. And then we have less than 1% of um, industrial. Um, and just to touch back on our, our residential property, um, we have 3,101,8,339 dollars in value. So just to show you that. Uh, next slide, please. So about our tax rate. Um, so you'll often hear people refer to a factor of one, which means a single tax rate. Um, if we decide to do a factor of less than one, what we're doing is shifting our taxes to the, the burden of our taxes to the commercial and industrial classes to lower our tax rate for a residential class. 
if we were to do a factor of greater than one, we would be doing the opposite. So we would be shifting our tax rate to our residential class to lower the rate for the commercial industrial class. And I will touch a little bit more on that as we go on. So we can go to the next slide, please. So here is some examples of our estimated impact with our tax rate. So uh, what this year for fiscal year 24, we're estimating a tax rate of $18.51 per thousand if we do the single tax rate, the factor of one. Um, our average single family home is $508,713. And with that tax rate, the average single family tax bill would be $9,416.28. And with the commercial, our average value is $596,087. So again, with that tax rate of $18.51 per thousand, the average tax rate or tax dollars would be $11,033.57. So then we get into our split tax rate. If we were to do a split tax rate, as you can see, we are estimating about $17.42 for the um, residential property and $27.80 for our commercial properties. This is at the highest split tax rate, so this might be a little bit more than what we're thinking. Um, but you'll see that there is an average decrease for single family homes of about $554. But then when you look at the commercial impact, it's an increase of $5,500. And so when we're looking at the split tax rate, we do need to think about our small commercial class, our large residential of 89%. And so if we are to impact, uh, to it put in place the split tax rate, we really need to think again, is it going to hurt our commercial class, which in turn is going to hurt our residential class? Um, so just something to think about with some figures there. Um, we can go to the next slide, please. So the next thing that we would need to vote on to make is the residential exemption. And I know this has been a big topic in the past. Um, so what I just wanna start out with saying again is that the residential class is single families, condos, two and three families, and apartment buildings, vacant lots, and any portion of a, of a mixed use property that is someone's residence. So the residential exemption would be uh, a shift in valuation for those homes or apartments, uh, excuse me, not apartments, uh, those um, condos that are owner occupied. Um, we can shift up to 35% of the valuation. Um, and that would be a vote that you all would make based on whatever decision you have. Um, and basically what we're doing again is we're gonna be shifting the tax off of those homeowners who are owner occupied. Um, this is gonna take some work. So I would recommend that if this is something that we are interested in, that we address it much earlier in the year. Um, if you can actually please go to the next slide, there are a lot of things that we would have to go through. Um, so an owner occupied qualified property is a single family home, a condo, a two and three family, and part of the mixed use properties. What we have to keep in mind again is if we want to help our elderly stay in their homes, they would not qualify for this exemption if they have a trust or if they've turned their home over to their children or other family members so that they don't lose it in a situation of going into a nursing home. Clearly, the, the, the second homes and rentals would not be included as well, and then the apartment buildings and nursing homes and um, large assisted living facilities. But really important to keep in mind uh, with, with apartment buildings, we're not necessarily hurting those who can't, aff uh, helping those who can't afford homes if they don't qualify for this. So their tax could potentially increase. And again, with the um, properties that are owner occupied, however, in a trust or owned by someone's children. We're not helping them. Um, we can go to the next slide, please. This just shows an estimated owner occupied status for the information that we currently have in the computer system. When we get a deed uh, through the registry of deeds, we often will look for a homestead act to find out if the home is going to be owner occupied 
Um, another method that we use as well is um, if someone comes in to change their, their address, their mailing address, then we can sort of tell if they're living there or not. Um, I do say this is an estimate because sometimes people don't do that if they're on direct pay or, or things to that nature. So there might be some some places where we could use the staff to update. Um, but again, this is owner occupied homes is about 67% of our residential property versus the non owner occupied about 33%. Uh, next slide, please. So um, just a quick summary, basically, we would uh, redistribute the tax so that those who do qualify would have a lesser amount. Um, as going through this slide, I laughed because I don't know if you all remember, but I called it a misdemeanor last year. <laughs> but the exemption is sort of a misnomer. It, it's 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 sort of it just shifts. It doesn't actually give anyone, or it doesn't give us all a break. It just shifts who is taking the burden for the taxes. Um, and then again, as I mentioned, it tends to um, penalize those of lower income apartment buildings. Um, you know the tenants potentially of those apartment buildings and anyone who's in a trust or um, having their family own their home as well. Next slide, please. Um, so if we were to, jumping back to the split tax rate, if we were to uh, adopt a split tax rate tonight, a small commercial exemption is something that uh, we could also adopt. Uh, any business that would be less than 10 people would qualify for this exemption. Um, but I also want to bring to your attention again, most of our businesses probably have less than 10 people. <laughs> so if we were to do the split tax rate and to adopt this, um, it wouldn't really do us any good uh, because we would be taxing those businesses that are larger, which are probably very few at that higher tax rate, which in turn could potentially push them out and cause us to have more vacancies. Um, and that's not something that we want to do. So um but the intention of this is, is to give those smaller businesses a break when you do have the split tax rate. Next slide, please. Um, so in quick summary, we basically would just like to recommend that we keep the single tax rate of factor of one at the $18 and I believe 51 cents. And uh, so we would keep uh, no small commercial exemption no open space because we don't actually use the open space here in Amherst. We use the chapter land properties instead. And if we do want to do a resident residential exemption, I would recommend to vote no this year, just because we need some more time to be able to pull all the data together, make sure it's accurate and make sure that um, we have all the staffing to um, make sure that we get all that done on time. Okay. And that concludes um. my presentation. And why don't we just have you stay there for the moment? Sure. Maybe shift a little to the sure. left or something. I'd like to ask uh, Nick Grabe if, as a member of the Board of Assessors, you have anything that you would like to add. Okay. Uh, so, are there any people who have signed up for public comment with regard to this issue, either here in the audience? And there are about 20 people. At the same time, there are 38 people on Zoom and many other people probably watching on TV. Is there anybody in the audience who would like to make comment at this time with regard to the tax rate? Okay, then I am going to ask if there are any counselors who have quick clarifying questions, noting that we will um, have an opportunity to address this earlier, later. Anna? Actually, we won't. So, Anna, yeah. go ahead, please. Yeah. Okay. Anna. Uh, thank you. I always somehow feel both smarter and less and dumber after these presentations. Um, so, first is it's kind of a long question. So, when we think about the um, the estimate of split rate increases and decreases, when you looked at it, it was like the five hundred and something, and then the five thousand something. Does that also vary by property value? So hypothetically, owners of higher valued properties would save more versus owners of lower value properties in terms of that for the residential. Does that, it, you said that on average, and I was thinking about when we were faced with the average when we were talking about the elementary school and it, it varied. Is that, would that be true? And is my assumption true that then higher value properties would see a, a greater 
decrease than That's lower correct. value. Okay. Um, so it would impact hypothetically those who are, uh, it would benefit those who are wealthier more hypothetically who own higher value properties. Is that Could. correct? Can, yeah. Fair. Okay. So, um, and then is it also correct that affordable apartment complexes would be excluded from that? Excluded. Uh, from the residential, from the residential exemption. Correct. Okay. So I think one of the things that I'm struggling with is it seems clear to me that the resident residential exemption, well, if you look at it just on the face value, it seems like a smart idea for a town like Amherst. It doesn't actually benefit our residents. Um, do you have a valuation of non-owner occupied properties in the pie chart? You have the valuation of residential. Do you have that broken out into the valuation of non-owner occupied and owner occupied based on your best I, estimates? I don't have it with me, but I can easily get that and get that for you tomorrow. Yeah, I think it would be interesting because as we think about possible so like possible ways to to um make larger changes. If we don't, I'm not gonna support adopting the residential exemption. I agree that doesn't make sense. But if there are ways that we need to advocate on a larger level for other changes in tax classification, I think it would be really helpful to know kind of what we're looking at in terms of the valuation of that that property in town and as much kind of specificity as possible with that mm -hmm. um, would be would be appreciated because it does sound like the only way that we're going to be able to shift that change, shift that that didn't make sense to make that shift and to um, kind of classify income earning residential properties as commercial is that is at a state level. Um, so I just would love more more data, please, if um, if possible. Sure. Thank you. Absolutely. And just to note as well, for I know that it doesn't affect everyone, but we are working on another senior exemption um, that's going to have higher income levels. Mm. So hopefully that will help. Um, in in other cases as well, so I know it won't help everybody, but it, you know it might help a much larger group of people than what we're actually helping right now. Thank you, and you're actually leading me to. Can you just briefly mention what uh, the exemptions that we are sure. that we do offer? Sure. Thank so, you. Um, starting with seniors, we do have two exemptions that are income and asset based. Um, they start out at a thousand dollars, and it's the same application. Um, if you didn't quite qualify for that, um, then you could potentially start out at $340. Both of those can increase to double as long as you apply and qualify every year. Um, we also have a number of different uh, veterans exemptions. So those who are um, at least 10% disabled or have a purple heart, um, you could potentially qualify um, as long as you can provide us with certain paperwork. And again, that can double as well. And that starts out at $400 and goes all the way up to a full abatement on your taxes. Um, and then we have an exemption for those who are legally blind. All you need to do is provide us with your certificate of um, blindness from the Commission of the Blind, as long as it has this year's date um, at before July 1st, you would qualify. And all the deadlines that we have um, is, is um, April 1st, so people still have time to be able to apply for those for this year. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, Pam, Bernie. Thank you. Uh, a quick follow up to that is how do we how do we uh, advertise the exemptions that are available? That wasn't my primary question. Um, I'm interested in in the sort of the valuation process and wonder if you could explain a little bit how what the difference is between a mixed use building, which was mentioned I think by you, and for instance a hotel. So a hotel is commercial, a mixed use building is valued differently than that, yet it is also a completely uh, a commercial uh, income generating business, if you could describe that. Sure, so briefly to answer your first question, um, we do, I generally go over to the senior center and have a, um, a chat with everybody about the exemptions that we do have, um, I think last year we did not do it on Zoom, but it was something that we had talked about. Um, so more people could join and then to hopefully maybe put it up on our um, YouTube page or our website. Um, the exemptions are also listed on our website. And for those who do apply, we do send them out to you each year. So, you know, it is a one year thing, once, once a year thing. So we don't expect everybody to remember. Um, so we hope that, you know, word of mouth travels um, I've been out in the field a lot doing a lot of inspections lately. And so if I ever um, 
you know, run into someone who, who's mm -hmm. mentioning their struggles, I always ask, do you get our exemption? You know, help them find out if they would qualify for it and let them know that it's there if they don't qualify, you know, when they may. Um, so to answer your question on valuation and the difference between a mixed use property and a hotel. Um, so mixed use property is any type of property that has multiple uses. So um, we can look at our chapter land and we can say, okay, well, there's a farm and there's someone's residence. So that would be considered a mixed use. Specifically to a building like downtown where there may be a restaurant or a store in the bottom and residents in the top. Um, those, those particular buildings, generally when I do the valuation, we use the income and expense method. Um, the reason for that is because there is income coming in from at least the bottom units if if not you know downtown it, it seems like there's multiple units uh, residential units involved so likely there's income there um, but if you had a, a building that had one residential unit but all the whole bunch of commercial units that could potentially be um, you know lopsided with the income and expense the the owner may live in the building um, so we do use the income and expense method on those properties. Whereas a hotel, we still use the income and expense methods. It is listed as commercial, um, but the intent of the hotel is for profit and not to technically house someone, but to have a place for them to stay for a short period of time. Um, so the DOR has classified specifically hotels um, as non-residential, but commercial for that very reason. Okay, uh, Dorothy. Um, all right, I'm gonna turn this on right here. Okay, yeah. I noted that the um, average value was in the 500,000s. And I think that's quite a bit higher than it was. And we're basing our tax on that. Um, how long ago, what was the value about three years ago and how likely is that value gonna stay at that high? Cause that to me is a big jump. I don't have um, the valuation from three years ago, but I can certainly get that again for you. Mm -hmm. um, I The way the market has been trending and the amount of money that people are willing to purchase homes for, I would expect this value to keep rising um, at the moment. We have seen sales slow down, but with that being said, they're still very, very high. Um, so what I mean by that is, you know, we may have, a handful of sales this week versus, you know, 20 or 30 sales, but they're still at the same high value um, mm -hmm. that we've been seeing over the past couple of years. Everybody was sort of expecting values to come down with all the rates increasing, um, you know, people not maybe spending as much money on homes, but it doesn't seem like that's happening. <laughs> um, it seems like people maybe not buying as much but the ones who are still spending that amount of money. So unfortunately, I do expect to see that value to continue to increase for a while. You know, I mean, there's been a crash before. I do expect at some point things will start to slow down and start to come down again, but I, I can't really predict at this point when that might happen. Um, but again, I would be happy to get you the um, average single family value for the, next, for the past three years, um, and I can email that right. uh, tomorrow. <laughs> One quick thing, is this rise consistent with our neighboring towns such as Hadley and Northampton and, um, or has it been higher in Amherst? Um, it's been pretty consistent across the state of Massachusetts. Um, you know, you will see certain towns have a little bit of a higher hike than others, but for the most part, it's really, I mean, it's almost been, you know, statewide, even mm -hmm. farther than that. And, and, you know, across the U.S. We've seen a huge spike in homes. Um, so, you know, I don't, I don't want to say, you know, Amherst is higher than anyone else because it mm -hmm. might be higher than maybe Hadley, for example, but Northampton might be right in line with us or right. vice versa or something to that nature. So thank you very much. Okay. Kathy. Thank you for the very clear Kim. Um, on the exemptions that people can get, um, I'm wondering if we can work with the town to get something simple that we as district counselors, when we do a district meeting, 
as it's near tax time, can remind people Absolutely. that these are available. And so I know you can find it, but people don't always know where to look to find. Right. Um, so we could be emissaries for you was, was one thought on that. Mm -hmm. And then the last is my understanding is the value, if our property values are going up because the market's going up, our tax rate is often going down yeah. because we can't collect more than Correct. a certain increase. So it doesn't necessarily, you know, people were worried if my house is valued more, my tax is going to go up proportionate to it's now 30% higher, but we're still facing that lid. That's correct? Yes. So you, so it's like a seesaw. When your values go up, your tax rate should go down and vice versa. If your values go down, your tax rate should go up. Another way that um, people tend to confuse me slightly when they look at it is your home is your asset. And so you want your asset to be valued high which in turn would then, you know, lower your tax rate as well. So if you look at it that way versus, oh, I don't want my value to be high because I don't want my taxes to be high. You do want your value to be high because it's your asset. So, and, and, and just like you said, you know, it is a seesaw. So if your value is high, your tax rate should come down. So the, the only other comment I want to make, because you didn't show we, over the last few years, um, you and others have shown us, um, some of these valuations on if we did the exemption. And one of the points that was raised is the higher valued properties didn't necessarily reflect people with low incomes. Right. So you're, prop you're someone who bought their house a really long time ago. So you weren't necessarily helping the people you want to help, that we don't have an easy way to do that other than these small exemptions. So there were some very good pieces put up that led us to, to agree with this uniform rate. So I, I thought that was a good insight that, you know, there are people that have, are property rich, but income poor. Yeah. Yes, that. yes. And that's one of the reasons too, that we are looking into another exemption because that for that reason, exactly, you may have been in your home for 60, 70 years. And when you bought it, you bought it for $10,000. Um, you know, you just, you the way cost is going, our paychecks are not necessarily going up, but everything else is, you know. Um, so that's another reason that we want to try to help out to keep people in their homes. Um, and I'm working on a presentation, so you'll soon see that. Okay. Uh, Andy, you had your hand up. I actually lowered my hand again because uh, Kathy's point was uh, what I was going to make sure was brought up, but I don't need to repeat it. There was one other thing that I had mentioned to Kim before, but I don't think that it's uh, something that we're going to be able to really address tonight because it's a complicated issue. And that is um, not really a tax classification issue, but an assessment methodology issue, whether there is a way of um, assessing houses that people own that they don't live in and are operating as businesses and whether they can be taxed on the um, income and expense methodology and whether that would um, shift property that is um, being run as a business as opposed to you know, the house next door, which is being owned as a residence. Um, and uh, someone had mentioned to me uh, recently um, that there was um, Northampton, uh, that the, they were doing something like that. And so that got me to raise the question with Kim. But um, as I said, it's not related to the tax classification hearing, but is something that the council might want to have a little bit more information on when it's available. Certainly. That'd be useful. Um, Kim, I just want to make sure, are we using the maximum exemption amount that we are allowed by the state? For the um, personal exemptions, yes. For personal exemptions, yes. for uh, elder, for yes. veterans, so, for um, blind. With the elder exemptions, uh, many towns will have $750 as their max. We do do 1000 as well as allow for that to double as long as um, people apply and qualify each year. And again, that, that goes across the board for all of the other personal exemptions as well. 
Um, there is the new senior means, which I keep mentioning, mm -hmm. um, that some towns have been adopting. And so that's something that we're now looking into as well and looking to potentially get your approval to send that request to the state. And you would come back to us off cycle yes. with something like that? Yes. Okay. Are there any other questions from the council? Then I'd like to move and seek a second to close the hearing. Second. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kim. Oh, we need to vote. Um, <laughs> thank you. All right. Um, let me find a place where I can record some votes. Okay, Shalini Balmil, we're voting to close the hearing. Yes. Pat DeAngelis? Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier? Aye. Lynn Griesmers and I, Mandy Johanneke? Aye. Anika Lopes? Aye. Um, Michelle Miller is absent. Uh, Dorothy Pam? Yes. Pam Rooney? Yes. Kathy Shane? Yes. Andy Steinberg? Aye. Jennifer Taub is absent. Uh, Alicia Walker? Yes. It's unanimous to close the hearing with 11 counselors in agreement and two absent. Thank you very much. We're going to move on to the next item. Uh -huh. Gen you're right, to general public comment. Again, let me mention general public comment. Um, it, we do have a special public comment period with the relationship to the uh, library. Uh, so this is general public comment. Athena, has anybody signed up? Is there anybody in the audience who would like to make general public comment, not specific to the Jones Library? I'm seeing one hand. And so we are going to have that one comment. We're uh, keeping the general public comment to three minutes. Um, and please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Maria Kapecki. Maria Kapecki, I live in South Amherst. I'm speaking tonight on the agenda item regarding what the town manager has done to help residents bear the burden of the debt exclusion to pay for the new elementary school. The motion that passed in April of this year read as follows. To request the town manager develop options to reduce the impact of the debt exclusion on residents by developing a financial plan that identifies an additional $5 million of alternative funding to be presented to the town council by November 30th, 2023. What we will hear tonight is that the town manager has completely failed to do any such thing. Back in April, Councillor Walker tried her level best to get her colleagues on the council to put some teeth into this motion so that this failure would be avoided. Walker didn't want any empty promises and pretty words. She wanted the town to take actual action on, of its own to lessen the burden of the debt exclusion override on individuals and families. The fact that the MSBA changed its funding limits for building and site costs is great news, but that does not relieve the town manager and the town from doing its own work to directly help the people of Amherst. In the spring, several of, several of you councillors justified your lack of support for Walker's initiative by expressing confidence that the town manager would work hard to develop creative options to find additional funding, confidence that many of us did not share and for good reason. It's especially galling that the town manager and other lead town leaders apparently did find the time and energy to lobby Amherst College to give money to the Jones Library a donation that will not lessen the town's share of this project. Meanwhile, the town schools get words rather than funds from this institution of higher learning. With several school roofs in need of replacement and solar panels and aging oil and gas boilers needing to be replaced with non-fossil fuel systems, I hope that the town manager will go back to Amherst College and other sources to secure funding that will benefit the schools, the climate and the taxpayers in Amherst. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. That concludes general public comment. We are going to move on to the consent agenda. The items were selected because they were considered to be routine and it was reasonable to expect they would pass with no controversy. 
to remove an item, please raise your hand as a counselor. Um, and after I go through the items, I'm going to also elaborate on one or two of the items as I go through. Uh, the following items, um, to move the following items into the printed motions there under and approve those items as a single unit. Adoption of South Asian Festival Lights 2023 Proclamation. Adoption of Human Rights Day Proclamation 2023. 6C, Adoption of Proclamation in, small, in Support of Small Business Saturday and Card Days and More. 8A, Adoption of Residential Factor of One Equal Tax Rate and No Open Space Discount for FY24. 8A, to adopt a residential... I'm sorry, thank you, to not adopt a residential exemption for FY24. 8A, to not adopt a small commercial exemption for FY24. 8C, 1A to F, referral of supplemental budget appropriations to the Finance Committee. Please note we will have conversations about these. This is just to vote referral. 8G, Dissolution of the African Heritage Reparation Commission. That's an, it, an, it is a change uh, on the wording up there, but I also want to take this time to express our sincere appreciation for their work as it is stated in the motion. 8H, waivers of town council policy on making recommendations for town council appointments to multiple member bodies. Are there any that people would like to remove? Dorothy, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, I guess I am um, confused by um, the dissolution of the African Heritage Reparations Commission because the, the work has not been completed. Uh, wouldn't you uh, absolve, dissolve it after the work has been done? Uh, the, I mean, if you would like to pull it from the agenda, we can do that and have that discussion. Okay. From consent, okay. Uh, pardon, Pam Rooney. Pardon me, Lynn. It's the AHRA. It's the African Heritage Reparation Assembly, not the new body right. that was proposed. Right. The assembly. It is. I did. I made that change, I think. Did I? I'm sorry. Um, Pam Rooney. To pull 8C1, A through F. I understand we'll talk about it, but I don't think it should be on that. Which one is that? 8C1, A through F. It's the only 8C number item. It's the 8C, which is the referrals for all of this to the Finance Committee. We're going to be talking about those. Do you want to vote on them separately to refer? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Kathy. We're dwindling down your list. Um, the, the collection of eight A's, I think we should be voting on uh, the residential factor of one, not just putting it in consent. Okay. So it's a, tri it's a triple line on that right. one. None of those require a second. So as we go through the consent agenda, we are dropping 8A, adoption of residential factor of one equal tax rate and no open space discount for FY24, 8A to not adopt residential exemptions for FY24, 8A to not adopt a small commercial exemption for FY24, 8C, 1A to F, referral of supplemental budget appropriations to finance committee. Uh, and 8G, dissolution of the African Heritage Reparations Assembly. I also want to note that the approval of the minutes has been dropped from the motion I made. Is there a second now for the motion? Second, Haneke. Thank you. Um, we will now vote. I'm going to start with Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Lynn Griesmeers. Aye. Mandy Jo Haneke. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller is absent. Uh, Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub is absent. Uh, Alicia Walker. Yes. Shalini Balmilne. Yes. 
passes unanimously with two counselors absent. We are going to then quickly move to just a few comments regarding the resolutions. And um, I'm going to call first on Shalom uh, to read the last paragraph of the South Asian Festival of Lights. Thank you. Um, as many of you know, Diwali and its many different forms is celebrated by many South Asians and very happy to share that we are going to be in the second or actually third year uh, bringing together the community and we're all um, you're all invited um, on November 19th which I will be sharing in the proclamation so all of those of you who celebrated uh, Diwali in its different forms wishing you all again a very happy Diwali. So now, um, uh, now, therefore, the Amherst Town Council recognizes the religious, historical, and cultural significance of Diwali, the Festival of Lights, and its message of tolerance, compassion, and of the victory of good over evil, which resonates with American spirit, and, be it further proclaimed, we, the Amherst Town Council, express our deepest respect and best wishes for South Asians, and all Americans in our community who celebrated the Festival of Diwali on November 12th and invite all residents to join us on November 19th, 2023 at Crocker Farm Elementary School to continue the celebration at the South Asian Festival of Lights sponsored by the Amherst DEI Department, Human Rights Commission and Amherst Recreation Department. I also actually that was the end of the proclamation, but I also want to acknowledge the Amherst Chamber of Commerce and the Business Improvement District for financially supporting this wonderful event. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mandy Johanneke, Human Rights Day Proclamation. Yeah, so this is the Human Rights Day Proclamation for 2023. Um, it is co-sponsored by Councilors Rooney, Taub, Greesemer, Haneke, and DeAngelis, and the Human Rights Commission. Um, now, therefore, the Amherst Town Council hereby claim, proclaims December 10th, 2023, Human Rights Day, encourages our community to embrace every opportunity to reflect and embody the values of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in their work for the community, and urges Amherst residents to celebrate this day with a communal reading of the Declaration of Human um, Declaration of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights at the Bangs Community Center on December 10th, 2023 at 4 p.m. Please join us. And I just want to note that is a new location. You will not find it on the town common. It will be inside and much warmer for the reading. So please join us at the Bangs Center on the 10th. And Pat DeAngelis, uh, Proclamation in Support of Small Business Saturday and Card Days and more. Mike. This proclamation has been sponsored by Councillors Griesmer, Haneke, myself, and Jennifer Taub. The community sponsors are the Amherst Chamber of Commerce and the Amherst Business Improvement District. Um, and now, therefore, the Amherst Town Council proclaims November 25th, 2023, Small Business Saturday, and urges residents of our community to support Amherst-wide small businesses and merchants on Small Business Saturday and throughout the year. Thank okay, thank you. We are going to move on to the action item A, which is tax classification, tax rates and exemptions. I'm going to read the motion and look for a second and move through the three of these. The first motion is to adopt a minimum residential factor of one equal tax rate for all classes of properties for fiscal year 2024 and that no open space discounts be granted. Is there a second? Second, second. DeAngelis. Okay, is there any question or comment? Then we're going to move with Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Lynn Griesmers and I, Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller is absent. Uh, Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer's absent. Alicia Walker. Yes. Shalini Balmilne. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. It's unanimous with two counselors absent. 
The next one is to not adopt a residential exemption for fiscal year 2024. Is there a second? Second, Devlin Gothier. Any further question or comment? Then I'll start with myself, Lynn Griesmers, and I, Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller's absent. Uh, Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Ernie. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Tubbs absent. Michelle Wa uh, Alicia Walker. Yes. Uh, Shalini Balmilne. Yes. Uh, Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. It's unanimous with two counselors absent. And finally, to not adopt a small commercial exemption for fiscal year 2024. Is there a second? Second, Devlin Gothier. Any questions or comments? Uh, let's start with Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. Michelle's absent. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Alicia Walker. Yes. Shalini Balmilne. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Lynn Griesmers. Aye. It's unanimous with two counselors absent. We are now going to move to the Jones Library Building Bond Authorization. Uh, this is an automatic referral to the Finance Committee. And I would like to welcome to, well, and may have asked people to make the presentation, which I will talk about in a moment, uh, particularly uh, Paul Bauckham and our town manager, uh, Kent Farber, the uh, uh, head of the, of the funding of the fundraising campaign, and Bob Pam, who is on the uh, library trustees. Other members uh, are here with us in the audience, are on Zoom. They include Austin Surrett, who's chair of the trustees, Lee Edwards, Alex Lefebvre, and Tammy. Is Tammy still with us? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, Farah Amin, and we also have Ginny Hamilton. And I'm going to start, and later I'm going to ask town manager to introduce um, our capital projects consultant. So um, let me just start. The purpose of this agenda item is to begin the process for increasing the bond authorization for the library. It is not a request for increasing the town's contribution to the library. The town's contribution to the library is 15.8 million and the assumption is that it will remain that. And there will be a clear opportunity for counselors to ask questions and request additional information. In addition to that, we will have a special public comment. Um, there is no vote tonight and there will be no vote on this until the finance committee is ready to make a recommendation back to the town council, whether that be by next week or a subsequent meeting. The process for consideration and of increasing the bond authorization for the Jones Library renovation expansion is as follows. First of all, we start tonight. In your packet, there's a memo from the town manager that includes an update on the estimates for the project. The Jones Library funding sources summary is also going to be part of our presentation and an update on fundraising. The MOUs are also included for your convenience, as well as our previous votes. Um, the presenters will attempt to respond to questions asked by counselors about the bond authorization. Those, though there have been some questions about the building construction in general, most of those can be discussed at a subsequent finance committee meeting. Um, it, but of equal importance, it is we want to make sure the counselors have an opportunity to make sure they request any additional information in preparation for the finance committee. Because this is a bond authorization, it is automatically referred that committee to the finance committee. That committee is meeting on November 14th, tomorrow at one, and again on Friday at one, and there are subsequent meetings after the Thanksgiving holidays. 
Therefore, while it is possible, this will return to the town council for a vote on Monday, November 20th, after the required public forum, it is also up to the finance committee whether or not they're ready to make a recommendation to the council. Your packet tonight has various items in it. I'm not gonna go over those since I've mentioned most of those, uh, but I do wanna mention one in particular. Uh, the town manager has provided an updated cost estimate for repair of the present structure. This is not an estimate for renovation. Please note that these estimates do not include the added cost of the impact of the statewide energy code changes that took effect in July of 2023, nor do they include the expanded asbestos abatement. Both would add further to the escalation repair costs. An estimation of the cash flow for the project is being prepared, but not ready for this evening. It will be ready for the Finance Committee by Friday, November 17th. And that will allow us to begin identifying when the town actually has to borrow for the project, which has not happened thus far. I just wanna mention that several bodies have been involved in support for this project over the years. Going back all the way to 2014, when the town meeting authorized the launch of the extensive planning process. When the, then in 2017, where they, when the town meeting approved the submission of the grant proposal to Mass Board of Library Commissioners. In 2019, the town council engaged in a variety of listening sessions. And this was one of those items in those listening sessions. In 2019 to 20, the Community Preservation Act, subsequently approved by the town council, approved uh, funding of $1 million. In 2020 to 21, the Amherst Town Council uh, process results in a 10 to two to one vote to approve project funding. In 2021, the town-wide referendum confirmed 65% of public support support for the project. And in 2021, the Jones Library Building Committee began work including ex extensive public outreach efforts. Since its formation, the Building Committee has been working diligently and deliberately through the process, doing its due diligence and ongoing value engineering, and will do more. This is similar to the Elementary School Building Committee which is ably chaired by town councilor Kathy Shane. Our job is to receive their updates on financing and to vote an increase in the bond authorization. If you would like to get into more details about the actual building, please make sure you attend as many of those meetings as you can, except for those details, particularly as it rates, relates to cost. I also want to just stress the importance of this project to the town. It is where we will house the Civil War tablets. It is a building that will, in fact, meet the, the sustainability requirements now set by the state. It functions in many ways as one of our community centers. It's an economic driver for visitors downtown and something near and dear to my heart it is often the other place where residents or where people who go to the survival center have a place to go, especially during winter. So with that, we're going to turn this over to Paul and you have a memo that you've prepared for the council. I have, thank you, Lynn. So first I would like to um, recognize and, and introduce you to Bob Parent. Uh, Bob is our special capital projects, projects coordinator who joined the town a few months ago. Uh, we brought him on to help with the school building project and with this library project and with some other capital projects. Uh, Bob brings a high level of technical expertise and a critical eye to the work. He works closely with our facilities people and building commissioner, and he's actively involved in the details of the school and library project. Bob brings a wealth of experience to the town, including serving as the city engineer for the city of Holyoke, 
superintendent of public works for the town of East Longmeadow and even served as acting town administrator for a time. And he's been an engineer with Ty and Bond for 15 years, which is a private engineering firm and a lot of other experience. So he's a registered professional engineer and knows how government works. And so we're very fortunate to have him give us some hours every week to work on these projects. And he's really made a big difference. Um, so I'm going to explain why we are requesting this um, additional appropriation authorization to borrow from the council and how we got here. So if you recall, the original estimate for the Jones Library and expansion and renovation was $36,279,700. I'm not going to get into every detail. I'm going to say $36.2 million just to make it easy for everybody. That was in April of 21. And the pre with, with that cost, the town's local share that the council approved was 15,751,000. The MBLC grant, which is the Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners was 13,871,000. And, the, and there was a $1 million commitment from, uh, approved by the council for the Community Preservation Act. And the rest was, was on the Jones Library Inc. Uh, contribution. Um, so this, along with the, this commitment from the town, along with the MBLC grant, through five payments based upon milestones in the project, left a remaining balance, which the trustees um, were going to address through fundraising. Um, the Mass Board of Library Commissioners requires that the recipient of a grant bond for the entire cost of the project. Therefore, at its meeting in April 21, the council appropriated $35,279,000 for the expansion and renovation of the Jones Lob Library and did all the other things, authorized the treasurer to borrow the money, things like that. And with the amount authorized to be borrowed is to be reduced by the extent of any grants received by the M from the MBLC and any other sources that we get. So with these two count, town council actions, the, the ability to the, the $15 million in the 1 million CPA, the town provide, was able to provide the full cost of the, um, of the cost of the building. To support this motion, the trustees of the Jones Library entered into a memorandum of agreement with the town that stated that the library would be responsible for and shall pay for the full library share of the total project cost. That was our security. Based on the updated cost estimates received in October of 2022, the trustees and the town manager enter in, into an amendment to the memorandum of agreement that recognized the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on construction costs and established a total project cost range of 43.5 to 49.8 million. Both of those agreements are in the town council's packet tonight. In short, the memorandum of agreement and amendment maintained the town's, maintained the town's commitment of 15.8 million with the guarantee to meet the remainder through a grant since increased by the MBLC from the, uh, and with CPA money and library trustees commitment. So as predicted, as we anticipated, the cost of the Jones Library project has increased to the impact of COVID and other building costs. Recent cost estimates, including two cost estimates that were received on November 8th, were reconciled and confirmed the need to adjust the appropriation and total borrowing authorization. So I've included a chart in my memo. I'm not going to get into that, but Bob can talk about it. He's gotten into this, the details of this. Um, what was good is that through the significant efforts of Senator Comerford and Rep. Dom, with support from the town and the library, the MBLC took an unprecedented action to recognize the cost increases and increased its commitment by awarding an additional pandemic escalation payment um, of uh, the, the, that increased their, the total commitment by about $2 million. Um, so um, there's a chart that shows exactly how much it increased. So I want to go into exactly the numbers. Um, so where we are is 15.8 million is coming from the town. That has not changed. 1 million is coming from the CPA. That is not changed. 15.6 is coming from the MBLC. That is $1.7 million more than they had authorized previously the last time the council looked at this. And 13.8 million is coming from the Jones Library. And the Jones Library folks will talk about how they're meeting this commitment. So if we want to talk about why prices are going up and what information we have now, if, if it's okay with the president, I'd like to ask Bob Parent to weigh in on this, if you will, Bob. 
Certainly. Thank you, Paul. Um, and thanks for, for summarizing my background. The, the point I want to make is that I've been working with and for municipalities for 40 years on capital projects, 30 years as a consulting engineer, and then the last 10 years as a municipal employee, you know, working on projects just like this. This is what I like to do. Um, I don't think I'll ever stop doing. Um, we'll see. Someday, maybe I will. But I've been, again, this is what I do. This is what I like to do. I like to get things done. I like to to see projects through the end to make certain that they get done on schedule and on budget. And that's really what I've done my entire career. Um, relative to cost estimating on this project, it's been a very rigorous project. And I've, I'm two months into this project. So there's a lot of history that you know comes well before me. But I I first even became aware of the project in the middle of September and then have jumped into it head first since that time. Um, the cost estimating process that Paul referenced involves two independent cost estimating firms, and that's all they do. Uh, there's one firm that's retained by the designer by Fine Gold Alexander, um, and then there's one firm that's retained directly by the town. Um, and they independently develop their cost estimates. We sit down and then we reconcile the numbers. In some cases, they agree. In some cases, they don't agree. Um, what has happened as the project gets closer and closer to the finish, and this is very typical, is that you see the differences in cost estimates get smaller and smaller and smaller. Uh, because a big part of cost estimating, particularly at the beginning of the projects, are is what you don't know. And you're trying to put an estimate on things that you don't know. And as you get closer towards completion, you know more and more and more about things that at the beginning of the project you didn't know very much about. So you had to make assumptions. Um, those assumptions get much fewer as you get to the end of the project. And that's, I believe, what we're seeing right now is we're seeing the two cost estimates coming in very close to each other. They're effectively the same number. Um, we've invested a lot of effort in trying to um, reduce uncertainties to the greatest extent that we can. Um, and the additional asbestos work that has been identified is, is the result of additional testing that was done over the last couple of months to make certain we identified um, all the possible uh, problem areas during construction. So we know about them now. Uh, you know, any any surprises you have during construction will cost more than they will if you include them in the bidding documents to start with. So that's what we've been doing. We've been doing our due diligence. We've been, again, trying to reduce the uncertainties um, by going through a very rigorous process to get the number to what the number is. And, and as Paul had cited, it, we're really we're right on where this project had been budgeted several years ago. Uh, so we're we're we're. You know, would would like it to be less costly, but uh, we're not surprised that the cost estimate is what the cost estimate is at this point. Um, so I think that touches on the few things I wanted to to mention. But if there's anything else uh, that I didn't cover that you'd like me to cover, Paul, certainly let me know. That's there may be questions, Bob. So thank you. Okay. So you know, I think that this um, project has been approved by the town and has been identified when I got hired as, as a priority for the town. It has been received the support of the town council from town meeting, town council, and a town election. Uh, we have invested a lot of time and energy into getting this project to this point in time. Uh, it's an investment in our, in our community and in our future. Um, coming out of the pandemic, we knew there were going to be challenges and we're hitting them. And but amazingly, we the town has maintained its commitment to maintain the funding that it has. It's the fiscal discipline that we talked about earlier. We've maintained that, and the um, additional funds are being actively sought uh, by the fundraisers. Since we have repeatedly supported this project, our job now is to fulfill the vision that that was brought to the town council, to the town meeting, and to the voters. I recommend that you vote to authorize the full borrowing amount. Again, there's no additional funds going into this project from the original town council vote. Okay. Um, and I'm going to ask one or two clarifications, Paul, and then I'm sure other people may have some as well. Have we already received any payments from MBLC? Yes, we've received the first payment. And MBLC grant program works differently than MSBA. MSBA, that's the school building authority. 
you they that's a reimbursement program. The MBLC gives us money and then we invest that money and we hold on to it and then we can pay out of that account. So even though you're as Holly mentioned, we have authorized but not borrowed funds. Um, there's a lot of funds like that that we have because we have to show the funding agency typically that we're willing to borrow the money if we need to. But normally we manage it so we we borrow as little money as we possibly can. We never roll this into a final borrowing number until the end of the project so we know what the exact number is. We use a device called bands, which are bond anticipation notes, which is short-term borrowing so we, we can manage our cash flow, which is what we're working on right now. So you'll see when we have to borrow, we do, we're very judicious about when we borrow. So we're borrowing just in time to meet the needs of the project. Okay. And some of that will become more clear with the cash flow mm -hmm. that we see on Friday. Uh, with that, I'm going to, I guess, Kent, you're next. I got to turn it on. Good. Okay. I'm Kent Ferber. I'm the co-chair of the Jones Library Capital Campaign being conducted by the Friends of the Jones Library, Jones Library on behalf of the trustees. And the news in the campaign, I'm happy to give a report because the news is brisk and prospering and we're doing well. I think uh, Paul's numbers need, I think, uh, in order to understand what it is that we've been doing and how successful we've been, I'd like to rephrase the numbers so that in the way that we understand it, which is that what we what we see as our task is to close the gap between the uh, the cost of the project and the, the sum of the town's contribution, the 15.8 and the MBLC uh, contribution. Uh, our closing that gap at this point it represents about $9 million. And if I could have, oh, sorry, that's the slide I want. I'd like to give you a sense of the way that gap has been closed over the years. Um, in April of 21, when you first approved this project, the gap was to be $6.6 .6 million. At that particular point, we'd, we'd secured something like 2 million, even though we didn't have a project yet, about 30% of what was needed. You fast forward to September 22, when you had to reconsider because of the increased cost of the project, which turned out to be 46.4 uh, in the presentation that was made to you. So the gap then was about $16 million. At that point, we still, because of the delays and the uncertainty of the project, we hadn't done as much fundraising as we would have liked to. So we were at a total of about 3.2 million at that point. And finally, you come to the fast forward in the last year, really put the pedal to the metal. And so the result is now we've closed that gap by $9 million. Uh, we, in addition to the, uh, most of the, the totals for the April 21 and 22 came from individual donors, but we have generated a lot of additional, the, the, uh, the MBLC additional grant and the uh, grants from the state, from the federal government. So our total is now over half of the amount needed to be raised. Where we're getting that number is, uh, is if you could have the next slide, please. Okay, so again, just to recap, the local share of the town is gonna to be 15.8. We do have the preservation grant of a million dollars. Mass Board of Library Commissioners original grant was 13.8. They've now, because of our work, have they, and we appreciate the help of, of, uh, of the town, <laughs> Pat and, and, and Mindy and, Dom and, 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 yeah, and obviously Mindy and Joe were tremendously uh, were, were basically made that possible. But we started the process and we worked through it with them. Um, then we, we uh, Representative McGovern was able to insert a one point one million dollar earmark in the omnibus spending bill last December. Uh, because of the hard work of some of our consultants, we were able to submit a grant to the National Endowment for the Humanities a nationally contested process where we got the largest grant in the in the program for that particular time period. We also were able to get a couple of other smaller grants from the state. And then finally, we've been out on the streets talking to the local community. And you probably heard about the Amherst Colleges grant recently. There was another $100,000 commitment from a local business person. So our total there is now $3.7 million. In addition, we have some other things since this is um, 
uh, printed, uh, we had another $75,000 in commitments, and then we have about another 100,000 in oral commitments, but we're, we're having a very rigorous process. We're not reporting anything until we can get it in writing. So with that total, as a result of all this activity and the involvement of a lot of additional people, uh, we have many more prospects. Uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions about more details, but having reached the 50% mark, I think I am as encouraged as I ever have been that we can close this gap. Time, time is essential here. With enough time, uh, we can raise this money. I feel good about it. Any questions? I'm happy to answer. Um, I'm going to go on to Bob, Pam, and then sure. have yep. both of you come up and make sure you can be there. Um, Trustee Bob, Pam, who is the keeper of the books and the overseer of the endowment. So, um, have you ever been given that title before, Bob? No. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Bob's going to talk about their efforts to ensure closing the gap and not putting the endowment at risk. Well, I think everybody understands that the question is, can the library raise the amount of money that is required? There's a second question, which is, can we do it within the time frame that is required of us? And so um, one has to look at all of both the money that has been raised and will be raised in terms of a time scale. Um, <clears throat> as it turns out that uh, Kent has been doing extraordinary work, um, but what he is reporting is the amount of money that has been both uh, received, uh, awarded, and committed, and those are three different sets of numbers. Some of those numbers will occur um, and have occurred already, and they can be transferred reasonably quickly. Some of it is awards which will happen over the course of the construction, and some of it will happen during construction, after the construction, and some of them actually a little bit after the construction is completed. So we have to really pay some attention to all of those things. You've heard the description of the fundraising, um, <clears throat> what we need to do is to think about exactly where that leaves us. And as Kent has reported, um, there's something over $7 million which still has to come. And that is $7.5 million beyond the amounts that have both been awarded or are committed. My my assessment after spending a lot of time thinking about the numbers uh, is that the the current commitments plus new contributions over the next three years during the construction and once the building reopens will supply much of this. I don't know exactly how close to the total that will get to us. That will get us. Um, if the difference is small, the library can self fund by withdrawing it from the endowment. Uh, annual withdrawals from the endowment currently contribute 10 to 12% of the library's budget, um, which, but that actually represents about half of the operating costs that are not provided by the town. So that's, uh, that's what I think about a lot of the time. <laughs> um, we can't take a huge chunk out of that, but the endowment, the endowment is built to tolerate short-term swings through two different mechanisms. Um, we take withdrawals for operations based on a three-year average of its value. So the impact of peaks and valleys in its value on the withdrawals available for operations are stretched out. For example, between 2017 and 2023, um, the endowment has swung between about $6.4 million and $9.9 .9 million. Um, <laughs> but our 4% withdrawal rate uh, has stayed essentially in a narrow and adequate band. You know, we, we have continued to have enough money to operate regardless of what happened in a particular month or a particular quarter. Um, second, it is conservatively managed um, to match the return of the stock and bond markets. And over time that produces reliable earnings that are greater than our withdrawals for operations with the excess available to rebuild any withdrawals that we may do for this or for other reasons uh, and to make it grow. So if successful fundraising is continuing, 
we can manage a payment to the town from the endowment of a, say a million to a million and a half. And we can go a little higher than that if we increase our draw rate. Um, but we might not choose to take such sums from the endowment or if the gap is larger than we can safely take from the endowment, then we will borrow. Um, I have projected what a loan of $4 million would look like, and that can work as long as fundraising continues. And our assumption is that it will, and it will continue on for as long as it's needed. Um, I'm not sure a gap of $5 million or more could be overcome, but that's a whole other issue. So what we've been doing is exploring several forms of lending. Um, one is a line of credit or other similar flexible loan for a limited amount and for which prepayment is simple, quick, easy. Um, second would be a commercial loan or mortgage backed by the assets of the library with perhaps a lower interest rate. And C, a tax exempt bond purchased by a financial institution at a still lower rate probably, um, but more complex and probably feasible only for a larger loan. Uh, we have talked to two local banks and they have indicated interest. One, after a fairly detailed review of our finances, um, but we recognize that they can't give a commitment for a loan three years from now for an unknown amount for an in undefined period <laughs> Shucks. But, this, <laughs> but it's still serious reviews that have been going on, and we're comforted by those reviews. And Bobby, because I was part of this conversation, we also talked with the Mass Development Finance Corporation. We have, yes. Which and is, the they're the group that would do the... That would be the ones who would give a tax-exempt bond. Right. And they have also said that as long as we can find an, a financial institution which is willing, right. you know, that makes sense to them. They've, all, excuse me, <clears throat> they've also described the process as being somewhat more complex, and right. consequently, right. that's why I think of it as being the way you would go if it is a larger amount and probably for a longer period of time. Okay, and just mass development finance agency is what is called a quasi-public corporation in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And it is specifically there to help um, organizations, municipalities, et cetera, fund and fund projects. And we have, of course, described what the library is. And they said, yes, you are qualified. Right, right. Um, thank you. We're going to now move to questions and particularly about clarifications from counselors but also recognize that we never promised to answer all the questions tonight. But Kent, perhaps you'd like to come up and sit with Bob. We have other people in the audience uh, that we may call on. Uh, and I'm going to now ask counselors uh, with regard to you know, respecting other, the three minutes, et cetera, uh, to begin asking questions. Kathy. Um, one is uh, a basic request. That was a great set of overhead charts you just gave us, Kent, so I'd like to be able to post them. And over the weekend, Lynn managed to get the details of the most recent estimate, the November 8th, and I'd like to get those posted as well. You know, both posted so everyone can see them, but um, when finance takes it up, it would be good. And so some of what I'm going to ask is because I've been staring at them since Saturday and Sunday <laughs> and then going back to look at what we looked at in 2021, you know, on, on where the piece. So, Bob, you said what what I've been focusing on, we still have this gap and I came, it's 7.4, 7.5. So, Kent, you were talking about how well you've done in closing the gap, but the issue that you've been grappling with is the gap got really big. <laughs> You know, it was a little over five million because CPA you'd already secured when we voted on it, and then it ballooned up, and you brought it down to seven point four. So one of the questions I have, and it's I know Paul is trying to get us this information, is if we assume all is well 
and somehow the rest of the seven four appears. <laughs> okay, so if we assume, so Bob, you said we could do one and a half out of endowment and then there's some additional things. When that flows to us really matters because if we have to, at the beginning, take on the $46 million, we had this flow chart with some assumptions that Sean did last time on the carrying costs. So there's debt for the first four years, first five years, before I think even the bond, the grant from MBLC gets paid out in five different chunks, I think. And I think Amherst College, they, they said they wouldn't do the, someone told me they wouldn't do the fifth, the new piece until the end. And Amherst College is in four pieces. So I would just like to see that flow and have people say, who pays the interest on that money before we're made whole, where we're held to just the 15.8? So that's just a question on the flow. And I don't know how you would work that out. That, that is being worked out by the town manager with assistance from our former finance director and going back to our original chart. I just want to correct one other thing, Kathy. We've already received the first payment of six from uh, the Mass Board of Library Commissioners. We are slated to receive the next payment as early as this next summer. So they pay on... On and okay, on. and that, that's all I'm asking, Lynn, is just it gets it's, laid it's out cash. because you can see that we're, we're not at risk for that amount of money because we're getting it, right. you know, in 2024. So I just would like to see that to have some sense of our carrying costs, because when we estimated the whole project in 2021, I mean, everyone knows this, we were in a world of low interest rates and we said, oh, we can get a 20 year bond at 2%. Well, that was really nice. <laughs> <laughs> or we can get the short-term bans at two. And then I think we had 2.8 for the 20 years. So I just want to see that worked out. Then I also have a question on the most rigid budget estimates on line items. It looks to me like the furniture and equipment budget is on the low side because it's actually lower than what we saw in 2021. And I know there was a cutback initially to just stay within the 36 million. So I want to know whether we are in fact on short on audio, visual, desks, chairs, mobile equipment. You know, do you have a budget to actually buy the stuff? Because I would not like to open a library with, we could go ice skating in it or something, but we need to sit. So, so just on a, is there a gap there that you had to cut back to make the numbers work? Um, and then the last part, Bob, when you talked about the endowment, what if, you, you said you could go may, maybe one and a half, but not five. You know, so where is the squish room there to really mean that we're, the taxpayers in Amherst are not at risk for this. It's the trustees at risk. So I would just like, I know you can't answer all of that now, but I'm hoping over the discussion, we would get more of that. Thank you very much. Uh, Pam Rooney. Thank you. Uh, Kathy had a couple of points that, um, actually need some clarification for Bob Pam. Again, that one to one and a half million dollar payment possible. Is that a one time or is that per year that the endowment can carry? Um, you talked about a loan for maybe four million dollars. Is is that the only amount because we're really talking about a seven point four million dollar uh, need? Um, another question is does that current cost estimate include our specialized code energy requirements? Um, and if not, does it still meet our energy go goals for the town? Um, does it also include the transition costs that we're looking at to move the books out and clear the space for, uh, for construction? Um, when the finance committee talks about this, um, I think we, 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 well, first of all, we, Everyone has said we aren't. The town is not going to contribute more than fifteen eight plus the one million of C, C, CPAC money, but in fact we really are going to be contributing more to the project because the um, the interest rate has increased since 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 the first council made that commitment. So I just want to be clear that the town is in fact has in fact contributed more. Um, when the finance committee starts to talk about this, um, I think. 
as Kathy said, all the different line items and the payment process and timing is important, but we also need to see what the effect of that uh, additional interest is, the difference between the very low and now the four and five percent that's being projected. Where does that where does that money come from to pay that debt? Um, if we are looking at the short-term ban, um, is that being paid out of our capital reserves? Is it being paid out of our ordinary 10.5% capital budget? Um, I would ask that the Finance Committee use that wonderful finan financial model that Sean showed everybody uh, with all of these expectations and and changes of number. Um, I'm very concerned. I am very concerned um, that the additional money and the additional um, interest rate or bo um, borrow has to come out of the capital budget, and I think it will consume a great deal of our even our current budget. So that is a real concern because I do not want to see. Um, today's needs being set aside um, because of the increased uh, interest rate and this and this interest and this uh, increased amount that we're borrowing. Thank you. Austin, you put your hand up during that time. Would you like to respond to any questions? I, I just want to clarify something just so that we're uh, we're as clear as we can be. Um, Right now, there's a seven million dollar gap. We don't contemplate that this is the end of our fundraising. So, one needs to, and that's what Bob was trying to get us to do. One needs to think about this in time. So, the the hope is that what Ken Edwards and their good colleagues have done, which seemed to some of you and some of us quite unimaginable couple of years ago, not only have they raised what they promised for that time, they've raised $3 million roughly more. So they're, they're at $9 million now. But when we think about the number that Bob was talking about, we're not going to stop the fundraising. It's not going to be a $7 million gap. It'll be a gap that will be somewhat lesser, and we hope much less. Lynn, can I ask a point of order? Sorry, the agenda had listed uh, presentation, public comment, and then discussion. Yeah. Are we having discussion or are we having clarifying? No, we're I, having I clarifying can't tell. And discussion, and then we'll go to public comment, then we'll come back. Okay, to so now it's just questions, discussion. not discussion. Okay, thank you. It, it's hard to separate them. I know, I just wanted to make sure before I raise my hand. Thanks. Dorothy? So the, I've got two parts. One follows up on the interest question. I really hadn't focused on it until recently, and then I began to get very upset. And I'm wondering, does the town have to pay all of the interest rates? Um, can't we have some of that interest rate paid by fundraising? Because it's it's a huge amount. It's it's really adds up um, with the higher rates and the higher cost. Um, so that's question one. Um, is there that? is the town absolutely have to pay all that interest rate. And the second thing is, um, in terms of again, when uh, bringing up the question about equipment, is there sufficient equipment? Um, I, I heard recently that the library still intends to get the $400,000 book sorter, um, but that it can't fit in the back room, which we had been originally shown, but that they were going to have to remove the director's historic library, which is to the right of the main entrance in the front of the library. And it seemed to me, one, that we don't want to destroy that office. Number two, that maybe that would be one way to save some money. So that, we, I mean, we're looking at ways to go forward and to do the things you have to do, but not to do the things that you don't have to do. So those are my, my comment questions, really to Austin, I guess. Okay, at this point, um... Since we've had some initial counselor comments, we're going to move to public comment. So I'm going to ask you two to step to the side. And if you are in the Zoom audience and you would like to make public comment at this time, please raise your hand. And how many people in the audience have signed up? 
you have to please sign up with Athena to make public comment if you are in the room. Okay, let's begin with uh, the uh, Zoom where we have three. And let me just say, public comment is no more than three minutes and um, counselors do not respond, although we're perfectly interested in the additional questions you may ask so that we can incorporate them into our further meetings with the Finance Committee. Uh, Tony Cunningham, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hi, Tony Cunningham, Owen Drive. Um, I actually had drafted some comments, but Kathy and Pam have asked a lot of my questions. So plus one to all of the questions they asked and the data they asked for. Um, so I won't repeat those, but as I wrote in emailed comments, I don't see how you can vote to authorize a higher borrowing amount when you don't have all the funds secured and you know you won't have them before construction begins. Time and time again, I've heard the town manager say he cannot move forward with a project without having funds secured. Why is it different in this project? To date, I believe only 500,000 of the trustees, now 16.5 million share has been deposited with the town and one of six MBLC payments has been received. While the library fundraisers have done very well to raise funds, they are now in reality further from the target than they were when this began at a shortfall of 7.4 million. And they've probably exhausted most, if not all, of potential sources of funding at this point. To properly understand the financial impact of authorizing borrowing of 46.1 million for this project, as Kathy and Pam have said, we need to see the debt service projections over the life of any proposed borrowings. We need to see the cash flow for the project showing when MBLC and library share payments will be deposited with the town. And we need to see the financial model showing the impact on the town's capital budget and reserves updated to reflect the higher cost estimate and higher interest rates. Um, when Sean Mangano showed the debt projections using the old cost estimate, it showed not only the debt service for the town share of 15.8 million and the 1 million Community Preservation Act contribution, it, talked, it showed the debt service on the bans. And like Kathy asked, who is responsible for that? Um, it showed 1.2 million in interest on those bans at that time with the lower borrowing and the lower interest rate. So I imagine it's significantly higher than that. So if we're saying that the town is contrib contributing 15.8 million and no more, how then can we say we're going to borrow and, and pay interest on bond anticipation notes? It doesn't add up. And um, so I think that's what I had to say on that. I just wanted to echo um, Kathy's statement that we need to ensure the taxpayers in Amherst are not at risk for this. And right now I cannot see how this is not extremely risky and jeopardizes the timeline for all of our other capital projects and our ongoing capital needs. Thank you so much. Dana. Yeah. Jeff Lee, please um, push the button on the microphone so the green light lights up and then state your name and address before you make your comment. Thank you. Thanks, I'm Jeff Lee from District 5. Uh, this vote for a supplemental borrowing authorization strikes me as rushed and without providing adequate information to really make a good decision. I know there's, you've said there's more coming, but it would be good to have it now. I'm just, I just discovered some new documents in the packet before I came over that I'm trying to digest. But um, I also found, frankly, that President Griesmer's and Town Manager Bockelman's Description of the library project sounded more like an infomercial for the project rather than a balanced look at the pros and cons. Um, one of the big cons has been brought up by several of the commenters and counselors. If we're borrowing nine million, nine point nine million more dollars, there are interest payments that are go along with that. So I find it very disingenuous for you to claim that we're only paying fifteen point eight million when we're paying interest payments. Could be even an additional couple million dollars or more. Um, so also the um, a new document I found in the packet related to the repairs. The library has frequently 
argued that repairs are going to cost more than expanding the library by 15,000 square feet. I ask, where is the capital campaign in making these repairs? They've never offered any contribution to the repairs, only to the new project. Um, someone mentioned the book sorter, which I find a waste of money and a destroyer of the historic character of the library. Um, I noticed in the budget that was put in the packet today that there was no mention of the book sorter under the audio visual line item that where it had been located in the past. Audio visual line item is 440,000. The book sorter was supposed to cost around 400,000. So, and the OPM was worried that that would leave little to pay for audio visual for the rooms in the new library. So that's a question I have, what's going on with the book sorter? And lastly, um, in regards to the financial indicators statement uh, presentation, um, I appreciate that Amherst has a bond rating of AA plus. Um, it's worth noting that Hadley has a AAA bond rating and the, at least last I checked, and the ratings agency point to their low tax rate as the reason they've gotten that good bond rating. So um, I guess that's my comments for, for now. Thank you for listening. Thank you for joining us. Ken Rosenthal, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. I'm Ken Rosenthal. I live on Sunset Avenue. I want to echo what Jeff Lee has said and comment briefly on uh, why I think this is a premature action tonight and at the Finance Committee in the next week and you again the following week, because there are things that are missing that you do not know, and because the bond authorization does not have to be approved anywhere now for the next several months. What you don't know, first of all, is what the cost of fundraising is going to be. That may not be a big amount, but it's going to be subtracted from the amount of money that's raised. What you do not know is an estimate for the cost of borrowing at various stages, and you're going to have to work that out when you know more carefully about what you have already raised and what has to be raised in the future, but that's a number that can be estimated. And the final thing that you don't know is what this library is going to be. It's a long time now since the library was designed, since it was submitted to voters, since it was uh, adjusted because of COVID, since it's been adjusted through some of the changes that you have talked about financially here. You have not seen the design of a library that is going to correspond to the amount of money that's been projected it will cost. Uh, Jeff Lee, for instance, has raised, and, and, and Councillor Pam raised the question about the sorter and the effect that's going to have on the, on the uh, uh, director's office and also the front of the building where there is going to be a hole punched through, I believe, through the stone. So there, are, there is a lot that you don't know, and you're going to be repeating this conversation again months from now, I'm sorry to say, and it doesn't have to be done now. I think you should relieve the Finance Committee of making that decision now. I think you should relieve yourselves of making that decision in the next couple of weeks until you have all the information or much more of the information that you're going to need. I want to make one other point that I should have made a little earlier. To the extent that the endowment is used, as Mr. Pam said, it might have to be used. That money will then not be available for operations. This is a quasi-public library. The town contributes to the cost of the library in many ways, and the citizens do too. So if the money is not there in, in the endowment and able to produce income, then it's going to be another cost that the citizens are going to have to pay. In addition to the deceptively misleading uh, a Community Preservation Act cost is not being charged against the taxpayers, which 100% of it is. So I hope you will put this off to a time when you have more information and can you make better decisions. Thank you for listening. Oh, I want to say one more thing in my 25 seconds. I want to thank very much all of you and, and the members of the library board for working so hard on this. I know it's not easy. And the fact that we raise questions doesn't mean that we don't love the library and appreciate what you're doing. We just want the best for the town at a, at a price that the town can fairly afford. Thank you again. Thanks for joining us, Ken. Athena. Vince O'Connor. Please come up and state your name and address before you make your comment.
Vincent O'Connor, 175 Summer Street. Um, first, I'd like to second what um, Mr. Rosenthal said about the impact of the use of the endowment on the need for operational support from the town. And there probably should be a chart showing the, the increase in operational requirements of the library that will need to be supported by the town uh, depending on the amount of money contributed from the endowment in addition to the other iterations regarding the use of the endowment. Um, but that's a key one. Um, I'd like to speak to the so-called fundraising uh, that's gone on. Um, I don't think I'm the only person who has noticed that many of the millions of dollars of quote fundraising is actually taxpayer money from a different source. I don't really consider um, that fundraising. Um, I, I, I wonder if people who pay income tax to the Commonwealth or to the United States would consider it fundraising either. Um, that's, that is taxpayer money from other sources. It's, it's not really fundraising in the traditional sense. Finally, um, what I haven't heard, and perhaps because I haven't seen the latest documents, is how this project is going to be staged um, on the site and around the site. Uh, I, I don't think we're going to um, contemplate closing off part of Amity Street or North Prospect Street. Um, and I'm quite concerned that after the project is approved, then, they will, then the project folks will come back and say, oh, by the way, we need from you to implement the authorization to take all of the parking spaces behind CVS so that we can properly stage the project. And at that point, it will explode the downtown in a way that I think would, would cause so much destruction that the library project is not worth it. And I would urge the council not to approve the bonding until they get a very definitive statement as to how the construction is going to be staged and where, and what the implications are for other downtown activities or the survival of other downtown businesses and entities. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Maria Kapaki, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Thank you, Maria Kapicki, South Amherst. A lot of the previous speakers have said many of the things that uh, I am I'm happy to have had said here, and I hope that you you heed this. Another thing that you haven't talked about is the forty six million dollar estimate cost estimate. That is not if if that would be frankly a miracle if this went out to bid and came in at that amount. Many other projects have come in higher than the cost estimates. The, the numbers that we're seeing here are, they're wishful thinking. The 46 is a wishful low. The 7.5 still to raise is a wishful high. It's also not even expected until long after this project will have been, would be started and finished, and then you're stuck. Um, that 7.5 million 
is a million five worse further away than you were six years ago. This is, um, um, it's, 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 it's mind boggling actually. And for this to have been brought up in this way, posted immediately after the election with a planned public hearing and vote the week of Thanksgiving, giving 10 days to make a decision on this when the information hasn't been brought forward, when the cash flow isn't even expected until the end of this week. Um, yeah. I do not support this. I agree with the previous speakers. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Kelly Irwin, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Kelly Irwin, Applewood Lane, South Amherst. Uh, I would just like to say I'm very much in support of this project. I am one of the people, uh, just a regular citizen in town was devoting a great deal of time to raising the funds and to continue to support the operations of the library. I'd like to invite everyone on the council and who's spoken previously, who's concerned about the funding to join with us, to help us raise the money to create the community jewel that we need in the center of our downtown. And I would like to mention that the Business Improvement District at Chamber of Commerce and the businesses downtown are extremely excited about this new development. None of them are complaining that this is going to hurt their businesses. We have already been talking about this for mm, maybe eight years since we first started talking about it. And the longer we go, the more expensive it will be. And uh, instead of saying no, let's all say yes. And let's say yes together. And let's do something positive, exciting for the town and move on to the other important capital projects and work together on those as well. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. That concludes public comment. We're going back to counselor questions and comments, keeping in mind that um, Part of what we want to do is gather questions and requests for additional information. Mindy Jo. Yeah, um, I want to make sure I've done my calculations right here. So the memo we received, I think, today on the updated estimated repair options has an updated estimate repair option cost to the town, right? Town's share of the estimated repair costs of 19.4 to 21.7 million that does not include any interest for the borrowing of that money. I believe that's correct. Um, and does not include compliance with the specialized code that we as a town council just adopted. So those numbers are actually probably low. What we're being asked to do here in a week or whenever the finance committee finishes its review is to authorize an increase in the borrowing amount, but where the town's cost, um, excluding the interest, but the 19.4 to 21.7 on repair just excludes interest on the borrowing for 19 to 21 plus million of 15.75 million, which is four to six million dollars lower from what I look at. Um, and right now, the gap between that 15.75, well, the everything that's been raised and committed and the total project costs for the borrowing that we're being asked to revote is approximately seven million, um, of which two million is historic tax credits that are there. And so if the historic tax credits are assumed to be gotten, and we'd, we'd be down to about 5 million in additional to raise, but that means if they stopped fundraising today and the town decided to make up that difference, and I'm not saying the town would, but if the town did, instead of the endowment, the town share would be 20.8 million, 
which is smack dab in the middle of the repair. And so I guess I'm trying to figure out how it is not the fiscally responsible thing to do to keep the town share at 15.75 million, do this project and not switch to a repair only because that would cost the town potentially four to $6 million more than what we're being asked to vote on when this comes back to the town. I, I think that is correct. It, so help me out if I'm wrong on that. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with your math. Um, are there any other comments, Kathy? I thought we were mainly trying to gather questions because I could debate some of the points uh, that Manny just did, but I don't want to do it here. I just okay. really want to focus on the project in front of us. Okay, um, please do. But if if we have an opportunity later, I would debate the points. I just don't want to do it tonight. Okay. Did you have any additional questions, Kathy? Well, I, I think I raised most of them and I've sent others to you, but I will. And, and I have shared those well, I've shared more, I shared them up to a point, but not in the last 24 okay. hours. You know, I can make sure that they're succinct. You know, Bob, what you said is the draw on the endowment. It would be good to know where the endowment is right now, the total amount. And that was one I asked you earlier, Lynn, and I can look at any budget to see what we've been pulling on it, but I just like to know where it is. Mm -hmm. So it, it's just putting all the little pieces, little pieces. These are big pieces in right. line. Thank and you. And I will collect the various questions, Kathy, that you've sent and make sure that um, the people know those before the meetings. I, I, I want people to think about this before I call on the next two people. Among counselors, we still have time to post a Friday meeting of the finance committee, if the chair agrees, as a committee of the whole. And if the chair agrees, uh, we should then discuss that tonight. Alicia. Um, thank you, Lynn. So I think like what we're being asked to do right now is just refer this to the finance committee. So that seems like sort of a small ask, but I think that for the finance committee to be looking at this really in depth tomorrow, that we are uh, missing some information in terms of making like a well-informed decision. And I think a few other counselors may have already asked for something similar. Um, but what I think would be helpful is having that uh, cash flow analysis, um, an updated version that will show the debt service, the amount borrowed each year, um, that would include interest um, and what the town portions will have to pay, inclu including that debt service. Um, and I'm hoping that that might be something that can get to us before at least Friday's meeting because um, I'm not sure that that's realistically possible for tomorrow. Um, and I do have a couple of other questions, mostly about process. And so I think one of them is, is there a reason that this needs to be happening right now? Because I do agree, and it, it feels sort of like it's being rushed. And so I'm wondering about the timeline and if there's any clarification on why this needs to, like, is there a timeline for this decision um, or what, is it possible to to wait um, until we have more information or what is going on with the timeline here, I think would also be helpful information to have. And then uh, what happens if the trustees are unable to reach their fundraising mark within also that sort of buffer zone that um, was talked about in terms of using the endowment? And I can't remember exactly, but maybe I think they said it was like five million or so. And so, what happens if that happen? If that does happen, would the town then be required to uh, cover the gap amount if we do sign this sort of authorization to increase the debt, the borrowing of the debt, um, or would there still be time to say at that point that it didn't happen? So I'm asking about like what level of commitment this document binds us. Um, and I can attempt to answer a couple of those questions, but 
but let me just be very clear. I We will not have the cash flow until Friday. And so I think the possibility that this will be a decision that gets delayed past the 20th of November is strong, okay? Um, but we will, there. we've already been working on the cash flow. Um, and um, there are various reasons to have this come up now versus um, February or something. Uh, first of all, it helps fundraising. Second of all, if the, um, as the library is planning to get ready to go out to bid, people are more likely to bid on a project if they know the money is there. And if they know the money is an amount stated, they're likely to bid to the amount. And if they don't, then people have to go back to the drawing board and decide what to cut. That's called value engineering or any number of other things. So there are, but there are reasons to get a commitment so that you encourage solid bidding and you encourage fundraising. Those are two of the many reasons. Um, Is it okay if I ask a quick follow-up? Sure. I'm just wondering when uh, when are we expecting to um, solicit bids? When are we expecting to what? I'm sorry. To go to go out for bid to ask for. Bids. Uh, my understanding is sometime around fe February. Would you like January? Bob to answer that? Yeah. I'm sorry. Bob Parent could answer that for you. Yeah, Bob. we we're actually looking right now to start that process in January. Uh, okay. Just. As a point of clarification, it's actually a two-step process for any projects that are over, I believe it's $10 million in, in funding. You have to pre-qualify contractors and subcontractors first before you even start the bidding process. So you may notice uh, public notification of that pre-qualification process starting um, as early as the next week or two. There's no commitment of funding to that, but it begins the process of defining who the potential pool of contractors will be and then the bids would actually be uh pub or would be advertised most likely in january for receipt in probably february beginning of march at the latest okay does that help alicia Um, yes. And then I wasn't sure if I was going to be waiting for the answers to the other questions or if you um, had some of those now also. Um, I think we'll have more discussion at finance committee what, in terms of the exactness of the plan of the trustees if they don't re reach their fundraising goal, although their plans do not include coming back to the town. They include taking out a loan or something of that nature. There's three options. I don't know. There's a lot more to all of that discussion. So uh, hopefully we can expand on that at the meeting on um, Tuesday and more likely Friday. Are there other questions, Alicia? Not right now. Thank you. Okay. Dorothy. Um, similar to Alicia, I, I want to, to know if there's an answer to my question, uh, which is, what are the rules of the game about who pays the interest rate? Must the town pay the interest rate? Is there any flexibility? Because that change in interest rate due to size of loan and re increase in interest rate has raised the amount of money the town will give. And we had said the town's not going to have to give more than what we said. So... Is there, is there flexibility? And does the town have to pay all the interest rates? That's really the question. Dorothy, I don't, I will, we'll put the question down and address it during finance, okay? Okay, thank you. Andy. Yeah, I, I just wanted to point out that there's been a lot of questions about um, interest rates. Uh, we uh, approve bonds all the time in this council for all sorts of things, fire trucks, buildings, whatever. And this is not a question that we ask. 
He said, we're authorizing borrowing of the amount of money necessary to buy the fire truck. And uh, we don't go farther than that. We also make a lot of uh, purchases that don't involve um, any uh, borrowing, but involve cash um, or paying paying from some from some fund that we have a stabilization fund or just from the budget, whether it be fixing up the bank center for the crest department or um, anything else that we might do. We don't talk about what is the lost um, interest of not having that money. We just put the money into the roads because we feel that it's an important thing to do. So um, I do think that the uh, council needs to consider uh, what is the consistency of our process here? Pam? I think we should think about interest rates. We are talking about a lot of money. We're talking about a period of time. We're talking about uh, a high interest rate, which is usually or has been in the past lower. So if we don't talk about it, we're derelict in our duty. So I, I think it's a good question. Mandy Joe. The elementary school building project did not discuss interest rates either. And that's a project that's bigger than this one. Kathy? Sorry, the issue isn't the exact interest rate. It's a question of, are we going out for 15.8 bond and paying interest on that, which we always thought we were? Are we going out for a $23 million bond and paying interest? It's the gap question, Andy. It's not interest. So we're just trying to get a sense of what our financial risk is. We always saw in three years ago, we saw there was interest on 15 million or 15 and a half million. Um, and the assumption was we wouldn't have that burden coming back to us for the rest of the 36 million because of the trustees raising the rest of it. So I think we're focused on this gap issue, which we'll know more about on Friday. Are there any other questions or comments on this issue? Seeing none, then I'm going to suggest that we take a break of 10 minutes and come back for the rest of the meeting. Thank you. You might want to turn your videos off while you're on break. Lynn, is there going to be more on the library? No, we are not. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us, Austin.
ladies and gentlemen, we need to reconvene. <laughs> Huh? I'm sorry, folks, people, we need to reconvene. I love y'all. Great. That's my favorite. Huh. <laughs> you should kind of get all the other stuff done tomorrow. Oh, sure. I'm 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 sure. i am sure 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 i am
Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Comments to follow. Yes. Um, and uh, then there's an appropriation from the ambulance receipts for to um, support the four firefighter positions because that the that ambulance receipt account was um, filled up with funds from the um, UMass Strategic Partnership Agreement. And then there's the other commitments of cre creating revolving funds for cannabis um, money that comes in and also for opioid settlement money. And this is just, as the memo describes, just mostly an accounting way of managing and account keeping track of those funds. Um, so I know these will be discussed at, at um, the Finance Committee. And then there's another one for, for the sewer capital funds. Uh, which Guilford, uh, in this, I didn't ask him to be here tonight, but he'll be here at, at your meeting, to, at the Finance Committee meeting tomorrow to um, take funds from the the sewer funds version of free cash uh, to replenish the, that uh, his accounts because they had some unexpected costs that went along with that. I, I just want to clarify under Council Order FY24-12A that that's three different funds that we're transferring to, we're transferring some money to uh, reparations. We're transferring money to the capital stabilization and some other money to just the other stabilization. General fund. stabilization. Okay. Yes. I just don't have the order in front of me and I just wanted to clarify uh, that that's what that covered. How are there, Jen, is there anything else you want to add to that summary? No, that's good. Okay. Yeah, okay. like I said, a lot of it is just sort of housekeeping. Um, the way that uh, the DOR works is these things are general fund revenue. They have to fall to free cash. And then in order for us to keep track of them and appropriate them and set them aside, we have to do all this fancy footwork to keep track of it. And we want to thank you for being the people that keep track of all that fancy footwork because we don't want to. So <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, are there questions from the council? Oh, yeah, somebody wanted to pull this from consent. I think it was Pam Rooney. Correct. So I think the explanation from Paul of what the various pieces are going toward uh, is helpful. Um, I, I know that in we have we have talked about um, reparations fund. Uh, cannabis impact fees, opi opioid settlement, and I understand that those, you know, we'd like to see pretty consistent and and um, uh, anticipated. The um, money going for so given that given that this is a a large amount this year, and due to everyone's hard work, we we ended up with um, a free cash balance of over $9 million, which is incredible. Um, I think we've had quite a discussion tonight about, you know, where where will the money come from to help support the projects that, that we're seeing coming down the road? And if we were to put more money into the capital stabilization fund, for instance, that becomes our bank account for helping make some of that happen. So I, I um, it feels in some way that that much of this money is already committed, but it also feels like we we ought to have a bit more discussion before the end of the year when the free cash amount is certified and we know for sure what we have, you know, kind of where we want to put it before it arrives in our lap. Thank you. Okay. Are there, Paul? Yeah. So, free cash has been certified. That's why we know that information. That's why we're bringing the orders to you now. So, this is the action that I think you're referencing, uh, Pam. So, free cash was certified. We're now recommending to the council that you take the actions that are in alignment with the policies of the council. Does that make sense? And so, Pam, I guess the the question would be, are there any of these different uh, financial orders that you would like to see changed that would change the balance going to end into any one effort or fund? 
I think that's the discussion that the that the finance committee needs to have. Okay. But, but if I, you have any I, other I, thoughts as a counselor, well, we, the so, finance committee wants to hear them. Okay. I think of all the the myriad of um, capital projects that were brought to JCPC and you know just you know one department versus the other looking for you know a piece of equipment or something like that. This is this is such a large amount that um, you know, maybe it's just the process. Maybe it's just the, the the process that we're talking about that we're locked into. Um, you know, would that be distributed in this manner, or would it be uh, distributed in some other way within the items that come to JCPC for consideration? Pam, I. I realize there's a point of clarification that might help you. This, the nine million, is the sum of what was there before this year plus this year. It's not a total of nine million new this year. That, that does help me. And that we we discussed that at a previous meeting when you were not here. So I realized as you're looking at this, you're going nine million. That was my action too. <laughs> it's Thank not you. nine million. It's Thank only you. about four million something. Thank of you. New, of new money. Okay. That Kathy. is that is a different. <laughs> Kathy. So so I think you know some of that discussion then actually happened in finance. So Pam okay. Pam, Pam would have missed it unless she decided yeah. to listen in. But one of the dilemmas we ran into, maybe it was a week ago, whenever we last met, is that we actually made a motion, Alicia made a motion to move the cannabis money into the reparations fund. And we said, well, can we make that motion until the town manager has to first suggest that this would happen. And then we say, okay, we can't tell them what to, we have this, who makes what. So now is actually the time, you know, if this allocation doesn't make sense for finance to be raising it. And the other way I think about this road money is at the beginning of this fiscal year, we wouldn't have been sure we could have allocated a million more to roads. We we already allocated 10.5% in capital to to through JCPC, and we took a big chunk of that for roads, but we were having to play it off on others. We didn't know we might have another million. So we're, we're building up our road arsenal is, is another way of thinking about it by by these end of the year and unspent money from the year before where Paul can, Paul and Guilford can go out and pay for a bigger contract. So it's it's kind of nice to get it at the end of the year, which isn't the end of the end of the year, you know, because you go out in the spring for these projects. You know, it's 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 a good timing to have the money be available. Okay. Are there other questions or comments from the council? Uh, seeing none, then we're going to move to a vote. I believe I am uh, with Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney? Yes. Kathy Shane? Yes. Andy Steinberg? Yes. Jennifer Todd is absent. Alicia Walker? Yes. Shalini Balmil? Yes. Patty Angelis? Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier? Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Mindy Johannicki. Aye. Anika Lopes is absent. And Michelle Miller is absent. So it's unanimous with three counselors absent. Um, the next one is the proposed to establish a safety zone in accordance with Mass General Law Chapter 90, um, 18B on paragraph 18B on Henry Street between Market Hill and Pine Street and other traffic calming measures. Um, I'm going to ask Kathy to speak to this and then we'll put it a motion. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. As I, I think most people remember, we were visited uh, several council meetings ago by the people from Cush, the Cushman School to talk about the speed speedway that their childcare center is on and ask if we couldn't do something to mediate. And that led to 
a discovery uh, and action by the council that a town can adopt a safety zone and child care centers are explicitly mentioned as one of the areas that you can have a safety zone for. Um, there has been some work done and Mandy raised a question about this proposal to move to do something. There has been work done to study the speed and cars. There's been some traffic studies. So when we had met with Paul and the people from the center, he said there'd been quite a bit of work done on that. So we didn't necessarily need to work, wait for a full survey. There still will need to be some decisions on what we're recommending. And it's a combination of three actions. One is in a safety zone, you can lower the speed limit to 20 miles per hour and you have to do it at a minimum of a quarter of a mile. So where does that quarter of a mile start and stop? You can do it for longer. And they've provided us with a map with a suggestion of where it would be. Speed limits don't necessarily lower speed. And you can come look at my road, which is posted as 45 miles an hour on Montague Road, and it's a 60, 80 mile. But so the, the recommendation actually, even by DOT, the state, is other kinds of mediation such as speed bumps. And so we've put that in as a second piece of this and it's either one or two and it would be right on the road just by the school to slow cars down. And then the third is there is an intersection where one there is a stop sign, but cars go pretty fast, fast past that intersection and cars turning in, there are periodically accidents there and stop signs would stop the speed as well. So we've proposed and had made, offered a motion as this package of three, and this came directly from them uh, as a suggestion. And Lynn and I both thought it made sense. There are DPW folks don't necessarily like the idea of the stop signs. They don't, they're not great fans of speed bumps. So there's still some work to do on what exactly would be done here, but this conceptually is a package. And there are maps attached to this that would show you where all of this is located. And it it is it will be a benefit both for the children's center, but also the people who live on this road. It's a very narrow road with no sidewalks and with two-way streets and large trucks use it as a cutoff as do cars. Um, so it's, 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 uh, it's a good place to do this. Now, this will be our first safety zone. So this does not necessarily mean this is the policy. We'll go out and put speed bumps all over town. You know, we would still have to say where else we have a speeding problem or a cutoff problem. It happens that the safety zone fits this place because of the children's center. We're, and we adopted that um, MGL provision on October 2nd. So we've already done the get the ready to move. So we're bringing this before you with a motion to do these three pieces, asking the town manager to do that and with a report back to us on a plan. So it's not necessarily on uh, exactly where this would go, but to report back by the end of the year, if possible, with a plan to proceed. Anna. All right, I'm about to be the bad guy and I'm just owning that now. So I have so many concerns, Kathy and Lynn. I don't, I, like, I'm actually kind of struggling with where to start. I, when we accepted the motion, when we accepted the provision about safety zones, it was really clear and it's outlined in the memo that Paul wrote to us and we accepted it, that the next step was to establish a process to create the, the criteria for these safety zones. I know that MGL gives some examination, some, some specifications of what that might include. I'm frustrated that the memo didn't include the, um, the speed analysis study, which is part of MGL. MGL says you need an, engineer, an engineering study that includes a speed distribution. Um, and so I, I don't think it's responsible for us to start setting safety zones as a council without this going to TSO. I don't think that it's responsible for us as a council to start to do this without considering the precedent that we're setting. 
Do I think that Cushman Scott should have a safety zone and should have these things? Yes. Do I also think this needs to go through TSO or through and with recommendations from TAC? Yes. I don't think that it's responsible for us to just start carte blanche applying safety zones without criteria. Um, when that was the step we said was in the process, that was the step we communicated to the people petitioning us to, to create those safety zones. That's been clear from the start. So I'm really concerned about the precedent of this council just deciding to put speed bumps and stop signs in when we have not done that for any other traffic, to my recollection, we have not done that for without referral to a committee and without um, the, the um, recommendation or input from our transportation advisory committee. So I, and I also don't agree with what you, with what I, I don't remember if it was Lynn or Kathy said that you're, you're asking for a report back from Paul in this motion. The motion is very clear that this is what, that these are to be put in. Um, not that we're asking just for a recommendation from Paul. So I, I don't think that the the motion is doing what you're saying it's going to do, which is just to get that input. So I think to to sum it up, and I, Athena didn't start the timer on me, which is kind of her maybe, but I think we, I would like to see a revised motion that is sending this to um, TSO or with input from TAC and a revise, or, or if that's not what the sponsors would like to do, a motion saying that they would like recommendation from Paul on this. And I'd like to see the engineering study before we approve this uh, uh, setting a safety zone. I think I mean, we're jumping ahead several steps. I'd like to just respond really quickly. It's not an engineering study. It's a speed study. And it is part of it. When you read the, the fact that this is a child care center qualifies it for making the 20 month mile an hour. So it, we could have brought just 20 mile, miles per hour, and then you'd figure out where the quarter of mile is. So yes, this was an effort to expedite a response to a group that's been asking for 30 years for action, and rather than putting it through a council process. But I think we have an alternative motion, Lynn, on the sheet mm -hmm. that rather than moving to motion to do this, it, the motion would be to refer this to TSO and go through a series of steps. So my understanding, I mean, this came to JCPC with um, a background that the police have been out and done a speed study and they talked about putting a blinking light in. The question was, could you put a stop sign in? Could you do some other? Because it didn't look like we could just do it until we found this safety zone thing that allows a town to do some extra steps for these conditions. But yes, the alternative path would be to refer this to TSO rather than on taking action tonight. I do wanna clarify, Kathy, that Mass General Law specifically says engineering study on speed. Um, that That is part of the, the law, the text of the law, an engineering study. I, I think we may be just quir quibbling on what an engineering study on speed is. It's totally, I'm, I'm just, just quoting the actual text here. That's all. Okay, Mandy Joe. So I second everything Anna just said because the memo in the October 2nd, 2023 packet when we adopted the safety, safety zones specifically stated, quote, in order to establish a safety zone, Mass DOT re requires the town council to make a finding as to the following minimum safety criteria. And then it listed three criteria. And then the memo continued to state, in addition to the above minimum criteria, an engineering study must be performed to validate the posting of signage the study must include an analysis of the current speed distribution of free flowing vehicles. The motion that is proposed by this memo includes none of the findings required in order to adopt a specific safety zone, and it does not reference any engineering studies that included any analysis of current speed distributions. I think if we went ahead with this motion, we would be um, deficient in actually adopting, and it would not be um, valid. In addition, the motion doesn't include any speed limit we would designate. I'm not sure the safety zone must be 20. I could be wrong. It might be able to be designated as 25. It might be it might be as low as 20, but I think we might be able to designate other numbers. I'm not sure. It doesn't talk about that, but any motion should require um, and include the actual speed limit we would be designating. And in addition, there is no cost, no 
attention to what this would cost the town because the adding of speed bumps, depending on what type of speed bumps you do, I believe is costly. And where would we get the money for it and how much would it cost? I'm gonna take one more comment before we put one of the two motions on the sheet on the table. Andy? Yeah, I think a lot of the, what I was thinking has already been said. I'm the counselor who lives uh, a block and a half away from the center section. So I uh, know the center section well. Um, I am very interested in knowing what the input is from the professionals at uh, the DPW, uh, because they have the traffic engineering background that we don't have as counselors. That's why we employ them. And I would like to have their input uh, if driving through that intersection uh, at least twice a day, if not more. Um, I'm not sure that I see a, a benefit and I just see uh, the need to make extra stops for a lot of people of which I'm one. So I'm going to put the following motion on the table and seek a second to refer the proposal to establish a safety zone in accordance with Mass General Law Chapter 90, Paragraph 18B on Henry Street between Market Hill Road and Pine Street and other traffic calming measures to the Town Services and Outreach Committee with input from TAC for a report and recommendation by December 18th, 2023. After we get a second, I'll speak to the motion. Is there a second? Shane will second that. Okay. And I also just want to recognize that TSO may not get to this and it may be part of a carryover memo. Okay. I wanted to make sure you, you understood I knew that. I, I did. Yeah. Okay. Andy, anything more? No. Are there any other counselor comments before we go, move to a vote? All right. Then we're going to move to a vote. We start with Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Tav is absent. Uh, Alicia Walker. Yes. Shalini Balmil. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Lynn Griesmers and I. Mitty Johanneke. Aye. Oops, is absent. Member is absent. Uh, Dorothy Pam. Yes. It's unanimous, 10 in favor, three counselors absent. Um, we uh, are going to move on to E, which is the option to reduce the financial impact on residents of the elementary school building project debt exclusion. Um, Paul, did you want to start since you've had the memo? Sure. Um, so this was re in reference to a council request to um, lower the impact, uh, reduce the impact on the taxpayers of the school borrowing, which is a debt excluded borrowing. If you recall earlier this year in April, you had uh, allocated $5 million from our capital stabilization fund to reduce the borrowing for the uh, school, for the elementary school project. Um, so there, so we looked into that and there were, so two things were happened. One is we lobbied in, in the support and were able to get an additional um, sum of money from the state MSBA, and it was a, you know, really led by our state legislators. But you know, counselors were were there as well, fighting for this money, and that made it a significant increase of contribution from the um, from this MSBA of nine point seven million dollars. If the council, I think in my memo I explained, if the council, there are no magic sources of money. The only other source of funds that the council could allocate within its power would be to take $5 million from the capital stabilization funds, which um, if you appropriate the funds into it, as we've recommended, we will have a balance of $6.9 million, closely seven, closest, uh, six point, close to $7 million. So um, you could take $5 million from that seven and allocate it to the school building project if you so chose. Are there questions? They could they, they, you could, if the, if that was the direction you want to go, I could submit that to you if that's what you wanted to do. Okay. I would not recommend that you do that, though. Okay. Comments, Mandy Joe. So I'll be clear. I don't want you to go that direction at all. It would jeopardize our other two building projects one hundred percent. 
Um, but my next question relates to the 5 million. It appears, and maybe my memory is faulty, that that the 5 million, that the capital stabilization fund used to have more than 4 million in it. It was close to nine or so. So the 5 million that we allocated has already been removed from there and put where is question number one, where is it sitting right now? Um, and question number two is what are the plans when we when we voted that a, a, you know, a couple of months ago, um, the, the belief or intention was that um, IRA money um, in for um, any green energy rebates would go back into capital stabilization. And so where is the standing of that? And is that still the plan? And how do we get that sort of in writing? Because I was kind of disappointed that the memo you discussed today didn't talk about replenishing capital stabilization with any um, monies received from the federal government for green building. So we've not received any money from the federal government for the green building. So that's that would come to you separately, I think. Um, in terms of where's the money is, it's an account. It's not like it's not like moving bags of money from one account to another. It's a, an accounting thing. So we have to account for it because it's the, we've already taken an action. So it comes out of that capital stabilization fund and goes. It's accounting wise kept someplace different. So it's it's accounted for in the school building project. So we know that as a funding source for the school building project. Do we have an estimate as to what the um, green, any green building grants we might get could be at this point or a better one than we had months ago? Yeah, I don't have that off the top of my head. I could look into that. Should, Kathy, do you? The the estimates were, uh, Amanda, I hesitate to say this reasonably accurate in that we had exactly how much we were spending for the geo the ground source heat pumps and how much we were spending on solar and the credit the only uncertainty is um, you could get a bigger credit if you paid directly for it rather than financed it with a municipal bond because they offset it if you were already getting a break so it's you know would you be getting 40 percent versus 35 percent so those those are the pieces there is there are some other elements that we potentially can apply for. And I think this is a larger issue that I've talked to Paul, because if we look across what we've been doing in the town, this new North Amherst library expansion, it went from oil to uh, electric. That's eligible for a rebate from IRA. We are doing it in other buildings in the town. So we need, the town has got to figure out how to file tax returns <laughs> They get this money back for us uh, across a series of pieces. So I think it's real money. It's just going to be how we account for it. The other piece that there's a bonus if you use um, local uh, solar panels and if you the, the workforce is a particular workforce paying um, a prevailing wage and our designer would always use those. So we will qualify for all those little pieces. So, so it was a decent estimate, but until we actually apply for this, we're going to be guinea pigs on a lot of things um, for these big tip pickets items in Massachusetts. Everyone is waiting for that first check to come back to a municipality. Okay, Alicia. Um, thank you, Lynn. I'm feeling pretty disappointed um, in this report <clears throat> and less about the outcome and more about what I feel like is a lack of transparency and communication as to what the intentions were uh, with, with the search for the funds for this. Um, and so I feel like I was told that we were gonna be looking at possible sources. And what I'm hearing now is that since there has been an increase from the MSBA that we are no longer going to consider additional sources, but was that the plan just all along in terms of saying that like lobbying the state for this additional monies was the plan to get more monies for the town um, to complete this project? And if so, why that wasn't transparently communicated when the motion was proposed? Because that was not what I was under the impression was going to happen. Um, and it feels additionally disappointing that the response is a possibility is to take money from the reserves, which I believe we've already determined is not a favorable option for this council. Um, so it's feeling kind of like 
we're saying there's nothing else we can do because we've already gotten an increase. Um, the extra nine million that's provided by the MSBA, which is great, and I'm super happy to hear that that's happening. Um, but when I made the proposal for an additional five million to the motion that Kathy proposed for five million, which would be a total of ten million off of the impact on residents, we're still less than that ten million. And saying that now this should be enough. Um, when I proposed it, people were saying it wouldn't even be a substantial amount of relief um, in terms of the impact on residents. And so I'm wondering why we aren't continuing to seek additional ways for the town to offset the impact to residents. Um, Andy? Yeah, no, I, I appreciate um, with Alicia's raising is a question, but um, as I look at it, that the major goal we had was to try and do what we could to make sure that there was something that would further reduce the burden on taxpayers in the amount that their taxes would go up by passage of the debt exclusion override. And um, as it turns out, um, that reduction can happen in this other way. But I think that we also need to be realistic that as Mandy pointed out, um, it does jeopardize other projects because when the finance committee last spring heard the analysis from Sean Mangano about what the alternatives were for the four building plan, um, the preferred uh, alternative that he presented to the finance committee was to try to the extent possible to use the stabilization fund to just pay for fire station um, or as much of the fire station as possible. And uh, so it, it is a question then how do we go back and fund the other two projects, which we know are uh, really cri critical um, for the town and have been postponed for far too long. And uh, any other um, amount, any other source is going to affect budget, either the general operating budget or other, uh, because I think that we've already talked about the capital budget. And we've um, had a presentation earlier this evening about how tight the next budget is gonna be and what the difficulties are of funding what the priorities of this council are. And so um, it's a question if we don't uh, uh, accept the recommendation of the town manager and go to another source, then I think that uh, we have a harder time when it comes to trying to figure out what our priorities are, because I think our priorities are going to have to deal with um, a reduction, an equal reduction in the amount that's available. Kathy. I have to say that getting an additional 9.7 million off the Amherst share is stupendous. And if I add that to five, that's 14.7. And we did work behind the scenes. Sean worked really hard on a memo with I reviewed it with our OPM to uh, the granting authority on raising the cap. I mean, we've been working on this all the way along so that this came through was stellar. And I, I'm pretty sure, Paul, you can confirm with me that when you were meeting with Amherst College, because I know when I met with them two years ago, we had the school on the map of, would you like to help us pay for the solar? Would you like to pay for something around the climate? And they came through with Jones. They didn't come through with the elementary school, but I think we shouldn't stop looking for that. And, and one of the issues that is helpful with the school is if, if we just get a grant rather than these other sources, the MSBA will offset our grant. But if we get it for things that they don't cover, and that includes solar panels, there's no offsetting. So if we get help, if there, we got more state money for our solar panels and or we got a private entity putting in money, 
um, it would again lower it. So I think that's where we should be looking. And the nice thing about that is we're not putting those solar panels on for a couple of years. You know, there's time to offset the full cost. So, so I, I think we should turn toward what else are we going to get in our strategic agreements or the lack of them. Um, and where are we going to start talking about what we were talking about earlier tonight on a bigger share of the education money on the millionaire's tax coming back to our schools, more coming back to our roads. We really need help with all of this. And that is the thing that we can really help taxpayers with. Anna? I think there's been... Okay, well, let me start with my really concrete question, which is, Paul, I'd really love to hear from you what the process and plan is that's in place for making sure that we maximize the Inflation Reduction Act grant money. Um, I, I want to. I'm curious who is responsible for making sure that those um, those applications get filed and all of that is in. I think I I am always perpetually worried that we're leaving money on the table. And I think what Kathy brought to finance a while back for, for the school around Inflation Reduction Act funding was really incredibly promising. And um, and so I'd like to just, if you could offer some reassurance that we, in terms of how we are, how we are making sure we are maximizing all of those opportunities. And then I think, you know, I wanna highlight, there've been a couple of times tonight where folks have, um, when we've been talking about this concept of raising funds or, or gaining funds for projects and where that comes from. And I, I think that we're not recognizing the amount of uh, effort and advocacy work that goes into receiving state or federal funds. Um, because when we say, you know, find 5 million, when we say find a funding plan, when we say um, fundraise, all of those things take so much effort and work. And I, I don't want to minimize the work that went into finding the, to, to finding, meaning petitioning the MSBA for increased funding. And I know that Paul did a ton of work on that. I know Kathy did a ton of work on that. I know Lynn did a lot of work on that. Like, I mean, I think that the, it's so critical to recognize the amount of advocacy and effort that goes in. And the fact that if we hadn't been pushing, which I think is really helpful, um, you know, that advocacy I'm sure would have been there because these are some really dedicated and committed uh, uh, public servants. But I also, I think that this this is a response to that. And I think it's a perfectly valid response to that um, to that ask. So I, I agree, you know, that dipping into reserves is not the, the way we want to go. And I just, I want to commend, I didn't think there was going to be an answer um, to that. I didn't think that MSBA was going to up it. Um, and, and I'm, I'm not often the pessimist. And so I was I was extremely pleased to be proved wrong thanks to that work from from the folks who did that advocacy. So I, I wanna commend the, the fact that you found more than what we were even uh, looking for. Alicia, did you wanna say something? Um, yeah, so I, I mean, I do agree with, with what Anna just said and I, do, I don't want to make it seem like I don't think that there was a lot of work um, that went into the advocacy and the, and the lobbying at the state level and that I'm not grateful for the increase because all of those things are also true, but just that that's not the answer that I expected from, that's not the outcome I expected from this motion. I expected the town to be looking into ways that we could make more of a contribution. Um, so it just kind of threw me in, again in terms of transparency around like what our intentions were moving forward and that was not clear to me. And so that's really my disappointment, not the actual outcome, but just the process and the the lack of understanding as to that's the direction we were going in this, as opposed to looking at what other possible contributions the town can make itself, because that's what I specifically asked when I proposed the motion. Um, and so I think some great examples of that could be what Kathy suggested, which, which I think were all really great suggestions in terms of other ways to find uh, to sort of take portions of the project and certain initiatives there and get funding for those things and sort of break it down in that way. Um, and I would have loved to hear or see some of those ideas come across in this memo. And I feel like that would have felt a little bit more transparent in terms of what I had been asking for and what I had been looking for. Um, so that's the only comment I wanted to make is that I just don't think it was very clear that this would have been the outcome uh, based off of the motion that was presented. 
Um, and so I do hope that we can sort of look into some of the things that Kathy suggested and move forward there in terms of trying to figure out how to get funding for other initiatives that are involved, like solar panels and continuing to um, work with Amherst College and other possible places where we could get more funding for the project. Um, so Alicia, I understood what you wanted was to make sure that people who were more impacted than others because of income level might be a way to solve or to address your original intent of this motion. And that this does it, but not maybe in the way that you wanted it done. And so I just want to recognize that. Um, at the same time, um, my president's reports include all kinds of topics that we discuss with Mindy and Joe. This MSBA funding has got to be at least there five times in president's reports in the last year alone, uh, which is my way of being as transparent as I can without calling everybody up and say, guess who I talked to today? Um, I wanna really commend Joe Comerford and Mindy Dom for the work they do in the State House. It is our pleasure as Amherst, town of Amherst, to work with them and have them listen to us in the way they do, and then respond with getting us these kinds of things. And when we're trying to fund something, as long as it's legal, I'll go wherever the money is. And if that means standing up and going to the State House and waiting on for four hours to testify on behalf of some bill at the state house because we filed special legislation, I'll do it. If that's what it takes to help fund Amherst. And if somebody feels like I need to be more transparent then file a president's report within every two months and talk about the fact that we're meeting with, with legislators and maybe asking them for money, then I don't know what else can be done. I'm sorry, I felt very criticized by both this and the library and the lack of appreciation for our legislators for what they do for us. Paul? Yeah, I do, I do. I um, When you read the motion that the council passed, um, I think I met the requirements of the motion and then some. Uh, the, the council voted to ask for $5 million in alternative funding to be presented by November 30th. So we have presented $9.2 million, $9.7 million in alternative funding through the MSBA. It doesn't say what the source should be. And if, if, if the counselors wanted a specific source, they could have commented on that. In addition to that, I offered the ability to take $5 million from your capital stabilization fund as another way to put an additional funds into it. There, you know, as I said, when I made this presentation, um, you know, we, we are always seeking, seeking funds and it's not just writing a memo about it, it's actually doing the work on it. Um, if I can't produce it for you, I'm not gonna put options in a memo. Um, so I think that, you know, I would just, actually respectfully pu push back to say I have met, met the requirements and the request of the town council's motion. Is there any other comment? And let's move on to councilor compensation. Um, this is a, um, well, we're gonna start with a report from the finance committee. I thought there was supposed to be a motion here and there's not. Huh? No action. Okay. Um, Andy, finance committee report. Finance committee was charged with finding uh, the money to increase the compensation for the council and essentially uh, we should start with the recognition that uh, there are three alternatives that um, were presented and discussed at the last meeting and those are the three alternatives. Um, one was to transfer 
funds at this point in time when we are transferring uh, money from free cash. In other words, we would take uh, a little bit less money going into stabilization funds as has been recommended in the uh, uh, motion that was referred to the finance committee um, and uh, ask that that money be um, added to the budget for the first uh, six months, which is the remainder of the current fiscal year. And then we would expect the uh, town manager to submit a budget for the next um, uh, fiscal year that would cover the second six months. Um, and another alternative was to just um, wait six months to start the um, increase and have it be only a half of a year for the first year covering the second um, fiscal, the, the uh, fiscal year that starts on July 1st. We have the um, situation here where the charter talks about a year, um, but the year doesn't coincide with the fiscal year. And uh, the third was to, uh, um, to try and suggest to the manager that uh, through the budget guidelines that um, the entire amount for um, the calendar year be included so it would be a larger amount requested from the next budget, but that um, the increase would be then have to be paid um, by um, larger payments during the second half of the year, and there would be no increases for the first half. So having recognized that, um, you know, the finance committee had a substantial discussion on the subject and uh, essentially uh, was recommending, I'm trying to give the... We yeah. look to Kathy, she's your vice chair. Um, Yes. Uh, Andy, I can I can help if you like. Thank you. Please. The finance committee thank vote you. Thanks, to <laughs> recommend option two from the August 10 memo to the town council from Paul Bachelman and Sean Mangano to delay implementation of the increase until the FY25 budget. So that recommendation, as I recall, means that counselors would be continued to be paid at the rate they're presently paid from January 1st until July, June 31st, 30th. And as of July 1st, they would be paid at the new rates. Is that the correct interpretation? That, that was the recommendation okay. finance committee right. made. I think with the with the understanding that it would be in the financial guidelines Okay. Including in 